Psych! <laughs> Dare way. Hello everyone! Yes, this is Luke Hector here. This is the weirdest start to a live stream ever. Absolute ever. Because, crazy enough, you were probably expecting uh, myself and Jeff from Boardroom Gamer to be here doing this top 10 hidden games list. But, uh, for some reason, I can't get hold of him. He's disappeared off the face of the planet and I can't get him on Facebook or Twitter or anything. So I don't know whether he misread my uh, messages and didn't know that um, I meant 7 p.m. GMT, but he knows I'm from the UK, so I can't imagine he would have wanted me to start my stream at midnight <laughs> in the UK or one o'clock in the morning. I, I forget what the time zone difference is with you in the States. I think it's five to seven hours, depending on what side of the uh, coastline you're on. So, um, I kind of odd on that one, but I can only imagine that maybe there's some bad weather in the States uh, or some other reason that might have knocked out the internet in his area because he actually came to me this morning to say, all right, what are we doing today? Well, there, and he was very excited to come on. So I don't believe that he's just gone away to be mean or anything like that. I don't believe that for a fact. Um, I just think that perhaps something's gone wrong, his internet's down, his phone signal's out or whatever, and he can't get hold of me and, you know, at the end of the day, I had to decide at the last second while giving them about an extra 15, 20 minutes to turn up. Do I do the list solo or do I do a Q&A? If I do a Q&A, then people who want to turn up for Q&As will lose out because I wouldn't do two Q&As because I'm already going to do one Q&A later in the week because um, I've not got one of these next weekend. But then if I do the list, I'd have to do it solo, which means that Jeff misses out on talking to me about hidden gems. So oh, yeah, the decision I had to make, but... um. I basically left it to you guys in the chat and you voted for, well, some of you voted for both. <laughs> yeah, you don't want much, do you? But, you know, many of you voted for the list in general. So I'm just going to do the top 10 hidden gems, my own list solo, and then Jeff and I will get together and do a different list. You know, he can still talk about hidden gems on his own channel, Boardroom Gamer. Uh, by all means, check it out. The link's in the description for you to look at his channel. But uh, we'll just have to do a collaboration at some other date. These things happen, but it is certainly a first for me. So thank you a lot for being patient. Everybody in the chat who has uh, put up with this weird delay, I must admit. So uh, what have we got? So Gems and Biscuits has turned up, which is great. Lillian's turned up. Jonathan Sash, hello. Christoph Stallone, Nick Oten. Uh, Jonathan, uh, I've already said, David Jackson, yes, and Sean S, thank you. There's a lot of people here. So And Paul Richards will pop back later. So as I say, I asked you, Bo, all you, all of you, what you wanted, and you asked for the list, so I'm going to give you it. If anything, the stream will be a bit shorter, and of course, I'll take some questions during the during the stream itself, and maybe at the end, you know, related to the games I'm talking about. And no, uh, no gems and biscuits, GWT and Concordia are not on my list. Thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, they are neither gems nor hidden, if you think about it. It's like, even if you love the game, you can't call it a hidden gem. So it's not going to match here. Um, what's that? Uh, so what have we got there? Just an FYI, it's also Mother's Day weekend, so time zone. What, does, uh, does Mother's Day in the States change your time zones? I'm not aware of that. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's some simple misunderstanding that's happened, whether it's to do with complications for time zones or a network outage or whatever. So, you know, I'm sure there's a good reason for it. I'm not holding any grudges or anything. It's like, you know, we'll just have to do something another time. But you came here to expect top 10 hidden games. Uh, sorry, hidden games? No, hidden gems. And I'm going to give you them. So it, it will just be my list. We'll get together. We'll do something else. These things happen. So without further ado, let's not waste your time any further and get on with 10. Okay, and I suppose one good thing about this is that I don't have to put my headphones on because there's nothing coming out of the speakers this time because I haven't got someone talking to me. But yes, we'll bring up the screen for Board Game Geek. So my number 10, 
that we have got uh, first, well, actually, before I start that, so we got David A, Paul Gower, and Board Game Knight, hello. So I have to admit, yeah, it, it could be, who knows, there's every chance he'll show up at eight, and if the, there is a time difference, and if it is Mother's Day, then maybe something happened. I, I honestly don't know, but I'm not going to dwell on it too much more. I'm sure he'll get in touch with me with a, like a thousand apologies or something. And it's just like, look, mate, it's totally fine. Not a problem. If anything, it's an experience. So my number 10 is a eh, weird little game. Uh, it's a... It's technically a space 3x, 4x game, but it, not many people will have heard of this one. And it's come out from a, a publisher called Wolf Designer. They also did a game called Guards of Atlantis, which is their kind of MOBA uh, tabletop skirmish game. But most people aren't aware of a little game called Warpgate. This one has been reasonably popular around my club. And it's essentially i mean look at that board game ranked 3999 this is you know not all of my games are going to be ranked stupidly low but it, you know in this particular case it's you know it's just one of those things so warpgate is a space 3x 4x game and for the most part it plays out much like a 3x 4x game so you've got your ships you're getting colonies you're getting technologies you occasionally fight each other through supremacy so it's a it's a typical style game but the reason this one works for me is the board and card system here you'll notice at the bottom there there's a 1 2x 3x and 4x board now there's not many photos for this game unfortunately so this is going to be quite a hard one to illustrate but let's see if i can find one with cards all right this isn't too bad actually yeah here we go we'll go with this so in this top right corner here, you can see these action cards, and they've got two actions on them apiece, and it's kind of random as to which combinations you get. Well, what you do is that you plan each turn, you have to plan whether you put a card down on a 4x space, a 3x space, or a 2x space. And the idea is, is that all the actions have got an X modifier on them. So when you play, say, move X spaces, you if you put it on the 4x, you'll move faster, but you've got to do it sooner in the round. Whereas if you leave it till later, after you've seen what everyone else has done, you only get to move one space. And so you've got this massive load of decision making to decide, oh, do I, I want this action here, but I need it to be more powerful. Uh, maybe I'll put it in the middle, but then if I don't do that there, but then I need to get a technology, which means I need that to go before move. There's a lot of those interesting decisions to make with this game. And it's not too, like I say, production quality is okay. It's fairly cheap plastic miniatures and that, but it looks pretty striking on the board. It's got a bit of presence and I've enjoyed my time with it. It's just, it's one of those games that doesn't teach you, oh, hello. We've actually got, oh, hang on. I think we just got Boardroom Gamer in it. Hang on, let's let's check this out. Come on, let's see if this works. Come on. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. Uh. You got to, uh, you got to mix, well, <laughs> uh, let's see what happened. Hang on, let me put me headphones in. We'll get right. this right. properly going. So... <sighs> Nobody. Just stick with us, guys. One second. <laughs> Wouldn't be an event, would it? <laughs> right. Okay. Right. I'm good. All right. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we're doing it. Right. Okay. What happened? <laughs> okay. So look. <laughs> Um, I put in what time is my time 7 p.m. GMT and they told me in an hour from now <laughs> Like it, it gave it put on my calendar in 15 minutes. You and I were gonna do the pre-show <laughs> Yeah, but I can't believe it. So so what gave you the hour difference then was it? Like I don't know if there was or... a button to check for daylight savings time or, or not to daylight savings time or like I zero idea <laughs> But it put on my calendar that I was going live at 3 p.m. My time. Yeah, which is in 30 minutes and uh, good thing you sent that message on Twitter and <laughs> and <laughs> I did all this prep work beforehand like I, I got my camera set up and my mic set up and everything beforehand so I'm glad I did that yeah that helped <laughs> and you can hear me uh, okay oh we can hear you fine I can hear you fine the audio is good uh, according to Lillian so uh yeah th th this it was just weird because I thought like oh there's got to be a time zone difference either that or you've had some tornado around your end that's knocked out all your internet or something so I thought there's got to be a legit reason but yep. it's time zones are a pain. But as I say, I asked people whether they wanted to uh, 
you know, you know, me to do the list or do a Q and A. I thought fine, I'll do the list. You're quite fortunate because yeah. I've literally all I have done is talked about my ten. <laughs> Nothing else. Which is that's your first one, right? Yeah, warp gate, which you may or may not have heard of. So uh, I'm not going to explain too much more about it because I don't want to rinse repeat. But have right. you heard of this one? I have not. I, I it's funny. I was in the I was in the room for about five or six minutes while you were explaining it. I have not actually heard of this one. It's any one. I, I just mentioned that. It's a space 4x game, but the cards, the action cards you place on these four slots, and each action card has a modifier for X. So yeah. the sooner you do it, the less powerful it is. The longer you leave it, the more powerful it is. Okay. Which is quite a neat law in there. Uh, David's starting to point out to me that we're in BST, not GMT. I'm, I mean, I got to admit, time zones are one of the most confusing things in the world. It's supposed to be GMT, and then it's BST one's one hour it i mean can't we just align all clocks in the world to yeah can't we just all be at noon savings? forever <laughs> yeah or just like screw daylight savings time i don't know is that yeah it, it is very confusing but i think i think in future when i get guests from the states on which is like nine all the time i think i'm just gonna have to say right this gmt this bst this est this gm pp wheezy whatever it's like I, can't, I, can't, right. I cannot keep up with uh all of these things yeah because Apparently, like 8 p.m. is GMT in the UK. So who knows? We had a <laughs> random right. misunderstanding, but no big deal. So uh... <laughs> hey, so I, I I only missed the first. So and I and I get to see it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, well, as I say, for everybody else, it's uh, Whoopgate. So we'll move on to yours then, and and we'll we'll just keep going in this order. So normally I let guests Excellent. go first. We're just going to swap it round this time. <laughs> Love it. Um, so I wanted to give a preface. You know, when we talked about hidden gems, it dawned on me like every game in the world ever invented is on BGG, right? Supposedly. So, <laughs> so, so there really is no hidden, right? Somebody knows about some of these. Now, whether or not they're mainstream or loved by all, I mean, I know that that you and all of your fans are super fr uh, uh, fans of Power Grid, like one of your favorite games. <laughs> that's not a hidden, was, that's, that is neither hidden or a gem. <laughs> I, I was paid to say that. Uh, Anyhow, uh, I, I listed mine from um, BGG's rating, not the not the uh, ranking, or I'm sorry, the ranking, right? The 3,000, 4,000, whatever. Yeah. And when I was cutting down my list, I said, uh, okay, nothing, um, nothing more popular than 3,000. So I started at 3,000 and I went higher. I'm, I got games all the way up to like 11,000. Uh, uh, 10, not, not, I don't have 11,000 games, uh, but out of my 10, they rank between 3,000 to 11,000. And I even have one, my last remaining game, that I'm hoping nobody's heard of, but it's really, really good. So Yours yours is probably going to be a more accurate list then, because I, I, <laughs> I looked at the rankings of mine, and I think the majority yeah. of them, if not all of them, are at least lower than 1,000. But oh, wow. I, I don't think I would have played many games that were 11,000, because I tried to define what was a hidden gem, and... Yes, I get the idea that it's like, right, it's something you like that isn't heard of by many. And yeah, most yeah. people are, will have heard of these games that I'm mentioning. Well, I would imagine some of them anyway. But okay. I also went down the road of, right, well, do I ever hear anyone talk about them? Are they mentioned from experience every time I bring it out. Does anybody know what game I'm talking about? It's like, I've had to go with that, probably because I've not played a bunch of games that are ranked 10,000 plus. <laughs> like well, okay. or something. To be fair, I only have one that's that high. So, <laughs> all right. So what's your 10, sir? Number 10, Magical Athlete. Aha. Right here. Okay. That's, the, that's like that weird chaotic racing game, isn't it? <laughs> it is that weird chaotic racing game. <laughs> um, that's all I know about it. <laughs> well, uh, that's about all you do need to know about it. Designed by Takashi Ishida and published by Z-Man Games, this copy. Um, why I like it so much, it's family fun, friendly fun. When you've got, when you're trying to get new people into this hobby, um, I found it successful to bring out something lighthearted, right? Um, and just something everybody can get behind. And since uh, we all really love Monopoly in this space, roll and move, right? This one at least gives them, okay, somebody did something really unique there with those it, I was gonna say, pieces. that is not normal. <laughs> um, it's roll and move, right? But then you add that character aspect to the die roll and they can kind of see, oh, well, my, my guy doesn't quite move like your guy and my my Amazon doesn't move like your Ranger. And so, so it gives that kind of feel of, introduction to a more complex board game with very low complexity. At the, the, I think the best part about this game, for me anyway, is there's two parts. One, the initial draft. Have you ever played it, by the way? 
no no okay. i've only heard this one talked about like, okay you you either love it because it's so zany and chaotic or you hate it because it's roll and move <laughs> sure well the draft the initial draft though when you're picking your super team as, as it were you're only given so many credits to spend on these on these people and uh, they cost a certain amount but if you skip on one next round that one becomes cheaper but then your opponent can get it get it cheaper so it's a little bit of press your luck uh, once you've drafted your team then every round you're drafting one of your team members face down so you don't know which one of your opponent's team members you're going to actually race against so yes there's luck and roll and move but you mitigate it by the by the racer you chose to go that round hmm. and they just so, all do weird effects and yeah you like the centaur that you have pictured right happens. there if he passes me he's going to kick me back one space so uh, the medusa is going to make or the witch up there is going to make you lose a turn so if you have a really speedy person well if the witch passes you you're going to lose a turn like there's always ways to mitigate somebody else's overpoweredness so anyhow <laughs> I, that's uh I, yeah i'd be impressed with with this one i i this is one that maybe like with a couple of drinks in my system at a convention <laughs> i'd probably go i not to say like the game's horrible but i think i think this is one that i need to be in that mood set yeah go, especially when i see that time saying 60 to 90 minutes that sounds like a long time to i don't agree with that at all mood rating. Is it much I, shorter? I, yeah, you could play a game of this in 30 minutes easy. Oh, that's better. Yeah, we, I need something like camel up length if we're going <laughs> to be doing this sort of thing. I mean, the artwork's nice and zany, that, but yeah, it's, it's <laughs> def yep. definitely one. And that, that one's obviously gone well, gone down well where you've used it, presumably, what, like family or just groups of mates? Yeah, yeah and good luck good luck finding a copy. I mean, it's out of print, and it's that is true. pretty sought after. That is true. I, I mean, I haven't seen a copy of it around the UK. I just heard it spoken about and that's about it. But uh, certainly, yeah, I'm looking at the rest of my list at the moment. Yeah, I think yours are definitely going to be more obscure than mine, which probably makes yours the more accurate list. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what the, the chat thinks of that. All right, For let's sure. move on to nines then. <laughs> Right, now i got to remember that I'm going first each time, which is always going to be a first one. So, this one, uh, we're, we're still on Z-Man Games, and this one made the mistake, I think, of coming out at probably one of the worst times in the UK you could do it, which was just after Christmas. So, you've already bought all your games for Christmas, you're spending your Christmas holidays playing all said games, are you really in a point where you're going to buy more games, or keep up with board gaming news after your Christmas dinner? Probably not. But this one came out at that time, and it's like, oh, okay, no wonder. But then it's designed by the same person who did Splendor, Mark Andre. It's like, okay, fair enough. That's got some pedigree behind it. But then it's got the most generic title in the world and the most generic cover in the world, which is Majesty for the Realm. This one, most people will know Splendor. I mean, if you don't know Splendor, then you haven't been in gaming that long. But very few people, I find, tend to remember that this is also his design. Uh, the one that came out afterwards. It is about the same kind of complexity as Splendor. I'd say maybe like a step up. But every time I bring this out, no one's heard of it. It's just, okay, this exists apparently. But I played it thinking, okay, this is going to be something akin to Splendor. It'll probably be a cool one, but maybe not up there. But it's like, no, actually, this is actually a pretty sweet game. You all have these location cards. Uh, let's see if I can find a better one. Ah, that's a nice picture. So... You start off with the eight locations, A side, B side, as long as everyone's got the same layout, you're good. And then, much like Small World, you draft these cards from the middle display, and it's like Small World where the end is free, and then you pay money, or in this case, knights, to take one further up. I forget, I don't know what they call that, it's the spend draft or something, we'll call it. But, with that said, you then place the character, depending on what colour it is, in that location, and you can see that they stack. And when they go there, they get you points based on what the character is. So, you know, this side of the inn might be per person you put there, get two points, you know, nice and simple. But, and that sounds quite simplistic, but each of these may combo with others. So like the, the pub might get you points based on how many inn innkeepers as well as chefs you've got. The queen's got her own thing. But there's also these knights that can go around the red ones. And then they can knock out certain people from other players' boards. And they go into their little infirmary. The witch can heal them back up. The blue ones can defend against that sort of thing. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's a case of, you know, 12 rounds of drafting from that middle display and putting them in your village to get combos off. But it's a, it's a hard one to kind of ex explain, but it's very simple to do. The currency for trying to draft from there is limited. 
So, you know, you're going to have to make a decision as to, oh, well, do I get more of these knights so I can do that? Or do I just grab the end card and, you know, work with what I've got? And there's majority scoring for how many locations you've got a person in versus how many you have in the same location. So diversity and uh, widespread mm -hmm. is rewarded for all. But it's a neat little game. It's not one that I tend to pull out too often. And I'm not aware that this is on, I don't think this is on Board Game Arena or anything like that, not to my knowledge, but uh, it's pretty cheap if you can find it. I don't know if it's still in print. Uh, we've got 2017 Z-Man games, maybe. But yeah, it just came out at like the worst time possible in <laughs> yeah. the UK. And I'm not surprised that no one found it, but it's, it's well produced. I mean, granted, they really needed more of these point chips. Because that was a problem. <laughs> it's like you you ran out of these denominations so quick in this. It was ridiculous. Uh, but it's got good artwork. It's well produced. I mean, everything looks very pretty there. And I can teach the game in about you know five minutes or so, and we're done in thirty. It is a, kind of like the next step up from Splendor. Does does everyone start with the same basic locations at the at the bottom? Yeah, you can mix and match to your heart's content A side and B side. The B side's got slightly more complex abilities, but as lot but everyone starts out with the same layout of A and B's. Okay. Cool. So if I'm teaching Maybe. it, I'll just so I'll just do all A's if I'm teaching it, but then sure. if people want to mix it up, I'll just go, uh, we'll have a B side bakery and a B side <laughs> witch house or whatever and, and and go with that. But yeah, just does a pretty neat job. And as I say, most of the abilities are like like, I mean, they get quite crafty when you have the B sides. I think this is definitely B sides. And that one there for kickoff, um, two points for every innkeeper there, or whatever it is, farmer. Yeah. But then everybody who has a witch gets three points. So you're sort of thinking, well, I want to put a person there, but then they've got a witch, I've got a witch, we'll both get some more points. So you, you might be helping other players out as well. This is some neat little stuff here. Lillian, Lillian in the chat beat me to the punch. Why didn't they just go for a Boxing Day um, promotion? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, but I, I think it, I think this was released like 31st. It might have even been like New Year's oh. Eve it was released. Um, it was in that week in the year of its release. And it's just like, okay, seriously, before Christmas, <laughs> ideally, or at least wait until late January or sorry, when like no games right. come out. <laughs> ah, well, yeah. okay. But yep, Majesty for the Realm. Give that a look if Splendor was your thing. Yeah, looks great. All right. So this one is rated 3366 on BGG, designed by Seiji Kanai and Kuro. Now, I have another game later designed by Kuro. That's K-U-R-O. This is published by AEG, and this would be Unicornus Knights. Ah, I know this one. <laughs> all right. So I, but... I brought copies of all of them. Do you see my library behind me? Well, part of it. But got <laughs> Unicornus Knights here. I got to tell you. Uh, so my wife and I are big anime fans, and anytime there's a, a board game that comes out with with big anime like artwork, uh, she just she, well she's going to pick the box up and she's going to read it, and then when she sees co-op and anime, basically it goes straight to my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, pick this up, and it has been surprisingly fun. Uh, you set this game down. Ugh. <laughs> you you take the role as this princess is basically her um, entourage, if you will. She gets ousted out of her kingdom by some tyrant, and she wants to go straight forward and, and take it back from him. But no matter the dangers, uh, she will ride straight on into her uh, own demise if it's not for us, the heroes, mm -hmm. to make a clear path of safety for her to make it there alive. It, there's, a, um, there's a bit of resource management because, look, it takes resources to to uh, mobilize an army, to clear a path for a queen to go get her thrown back. So uh, we have to share resources among us, but they have to follow the trail. So if you see some of these tiles here, the, uh, the resources have to follow the trail of tiles where our heroes are. We can't just like hop over empty tiles. So if I wanna pass a resource from the uh, bottom right to the upper left, I have to have people in each of those tiles to like, you know, like a, like a transport, if you will. Yeah. So you have to spend uh, gold to mobilize the army, clear a path for the priest, uh, for the princess to make it to the tyrant and defeat him. It, uh, Lillian again says, sounds like a Japanese RPG. It plays a lot like that. Every yeah. tile, it's modular, so I love that about it, so that your plays aren't the same every time. And every tile has an associated boss fight with it. So there's some semblance of doom on each tile on top of 
the regular dangers, there's always a boss that you're, that you're fighting. You can mix and match the heroes. There's, um, I want to say 10 or so to choose from, but you only have like a three or four player game. So you always have yeah. a bunch of different heroes to be. Uh, again, clear the path so that she can make it to the tyrant and fight her way back to victory. Yeah, it was a weird one. The, the kind of the, the overzealous princess who isn't like, she's not weak, but she no. can't take on the entire army by herself. And you're just sort of casually going, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah stab, <laughs> like, get him <laughs> out of the way, just so you can ride on past and say it was you. It's, it's an odd one. I mean, it sounds like it should be its own anime series. Yeah, <laughs> just two. Like, it, you, you could make this into an OVA, I think. Without two, She made it two times. I tested that just in case. I'm like, okay, how strong is she, right? She got two right. tiles. She died on the third. I was like, okay, you know what? What if we don't block her? We're just going to do, do, you know what? You want to go ahead? Go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> you just sent and her to a death. Well done. Yeah. She made it to the second tile alive. Not to the third, though. <laughs> yeah. This was definitely a hit one because it came out and I got quite excited to try this one as well because I thought, oh, this co-op theme sounds pretty good. The problem I had was it was that this was not an easy game to get the rule set down. Gorgeous. Though. Game. It, it was, it, oh, it looks great. I mean, it's got the anime artwork down to a T. And there was a friend of mine that I used this on because I know that he, I mean, I like anime, certain specific animes, and my friends are much more fanatic. But we struggled to get the rule set down. This was quite convoluted in its rule set to try and understand, right, so hang on. So when she does this or when this boss goes here, that happens. And I think it, it got, it reached a level that we weren't comfortable with, despite <laughs> despite loving the, like, the theme of this. Yeah. Yeah, it was a fun game. I really, really enjoyed it. And, you know, when the uh, pandemic hit and, you know, solo games just started exploding, this became a really good, uh, a good time too. Should we go there? I mean, Lillian says it's like sounding like a typical magical girl trope. I'm not sure this has got any... Oh, no, magical I would... girl. Sorry, I was thinking magical athlete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I still wouldn't think that like it, it's got a little more fantasy and a, a little bit more... It, it's good though. I, I really like this one. That, it, it, I say it, it was it was a decent enough game. It was just that that rule set kind of put us off doing repeat sure. plays. We played it a few times, did the review, and said this is cool. Didn't want to hang on to it, but we were glad to try it. And yeah, I wonder if you can even. I mean, if you find it, it's going to be on a discount somewhere. Yeah, I can't think of anyone in my area that's selling this brand new. It's just sort <laughs> of came, didn't get as much buzz as they hoped, and then it's kind of disappeared. Makes it a hidden gem. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so if it if it's the list, <laughs> more people have just got to find it first. That's the only problem with it. Yeah. Alrighty, uh let's say yes, you went second, so eight. So my ad is right. Now, there's a little caveat with this one. Right, as of now, it probably isn't that hidden. <laughs> it's definitely a gem of a game, but this has entered wider distribution now like in the last okay. say year max all right uh, several years ago three or four years ago this was definitely a hidden gem because the only people that were selling it was i think korea board games or whatever they're called in essen i had never heard of it came across it i think eric summer mentioned it on the dice tower panel while i was there i thought okay that sounds good for a solo game i'll go with it and find out what it is and i got shown by a lovely taiwanese lady and instantly bought the game the second i played it and yes, Stronghold Games have now brought this out now, but Coffee Roaster is still not heard of by a ton of people. But when I got it, when I found out about it, it was literally, if you weren't at Essen, you didn't know this game existed. Yeah. So for me, this was the epitome of a hidden gem at the time, hence the site caveat there. Um, but with this one, a nice little solo game. This is like the Stronghold version that they got now done by Sashi and Sashi. And... Yeah, the this is their edition. I had a Korean version. I wonder if it will turn up in the pictures somewhere. But very straightforward bag building game where you brew a coffee. Is this one you're yeah. familiar with? Yeah, you've you must have heard of this one, surely. Yeah, oh well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, stronghold in your area. But you've got the tokens in the bag, you pick one of the coffee recipes to do. It tells you what tokens to put in, these beans labeled zero to four, a few special ability tokens on here. You draw so many out each round and you've got to manipulate those tokens in some way. Let them roast over time, but this is dial up here, put them on this track to trigger off special abilities, like, you know, put tokens in, take them out, get rid of waste, you know, that, that kind of stuff. But then eventually once you're ready and you've decided, you know what, I've roasted this for long enough, you then decide, right, I'm gonna brew my coffee. And then you get to the second part where you draw 10 tiles out of the bag and fill up your coffee mug, trying to match the 
the requirements of the recipe you've taken. So roast rating 16 or something. You've got to count up the numbers. I need two blues and a red in my thing. Well, you know, there's one blue, there's one red. Hopefully another one turns up. It, it's like very simple, light game like that. You can get one of these. To, ah, here we go. This is perfect. This is the version I had. Okay. I've got the Stronghold version now. This was the Korean uh, version before. And as I say, pick and choose whichever artwork you like. This is definitely much more that Sashi and Sashi style artwork that you might have seen on some of their other Roll and Write games and that. But it was just really nice. It was well produced, not too expensive. And I just fell in love with it. And it's still on my shelf. And I've got rid of this version. I don't need two versions. But, you know, I definitely really enjoyed this solo game. Yeah. So it, it has some uh tones of uh quacks what's that quacks of, Qued quacks of quedlinburg uh well i mean quacks of quedlinburg is a bag building name as well the but, but you're, uh, you're you're bringing out you're bringing out the tokens per, like as ingredients I, in in this one you're filling it in an order right or, or trying well, to well with quacks you you have that spinny dial thing and you put sure. them in the sequence around and then when the round ends they go back in the bag and you buy more here you don't buy any more you get this like set of tokens to begin with and then the tokens change as the game goes on so I might oh. draw out a bun if i draw out a bunch of zeros at the end of a round they'll turn into ones okay and ones will turn into twos and so on because you're roasting them for so longer it's like you're you're letting them burn alive okay and, you need but there's other ones in there like smoke you want that you know muffles the taste you've got bad beans You've got stubborn beans that take an extra. Nothing round worse than bad beans. <laughs> exactly, but I mean, and you got the various other bits. You get like you know sweetness. You might want in your coffee, depending on what ones you've got. I mean, it gives you some interesting trivia about it. But yeah, it's wider distribution now, which is fair enough. You know, hence the caveat. And I didn't yeah. put it further up the list for that reason because it would be higher if it was just going by that. But sure. yeah, as soon as I saw it at Essen, it's like I've got it. And then every time I talked about it, everybody had a go at me because it's like, Luke, we don't know this game. We don't know where to get it from. And it's like, I can't help that. That's <laughs> career. I don't know. It's like, <laughs> it may not have been career that released it originally, but it's definitely around that area. Yeah. All right. Cute. Yeah. That looks fun. I, um, as, again, it's another a game that, uh, so my wife loves coffee a lot, and she picks it up at the store a lot and looks at it and puts it back, <laughs> looks looks at it, puts it back. So now, now having watched this video, hopefully she's watching this video. <laughs> so give um, it a try. If you like yeah, she'll have to give it a shot. All right. You ready? Yep. Yeah, you're right. We're jumping to the 4,000s. <laughs> <laughs> Diving deep, uh, 4,483. This one's by Queen Games, des designed by Shun and Aya Taguchi. Let's see, do I have it? Yep, it is Skylands. I know, only by name, that is definitely a hidden one, yeah. <laughs> All right, Skylands would be a very, a little bit like, a little bit like Carcassonne, only in the fact that you are tile drafting. Um, but then there's four different actions that you can take. So as we look at the pictures here, I'll kind of give you the quick breakdown. Um, it is, four, is two to four. It's for two to four players. Um, and when you draft your tiles, so those are the four actions there. Um, you can draft a tile. You can, you can get workers. You can buy a specific tile. Or the bottom right corner is uh, generate energy. So when you're generating energy, you use that energy to get victory points. So why I say it's like Carcassonne is you can see these tiles are very, they look a lot like Carcassonne, but the little squares on them are where you can put people. The people have to match the color of the squares. So the people are all in the middle, they're inhabitants. You use those inhabitants to buy the special tiles. Then you use the special tiles to score more points. And then the, uh, you use the, the blue little inhabitants to power your cities, to get more points. It, basically it's like this. It's one of those games where you follow the turn leader. So if you take a, an action, you get the bonus, but we all get the base action. Yeah, so yeah. I like, yeah, I like that about that. And also when you take an action, so let's say you take that yellow action at the bottom right corner to, uh, to build an island, you place your pawn there. You cannot take that action next turn again. You have to move it to a different, one of those different three spaces. Now I can put my pawn there on my turn, even though yours is there, you just can't take the same action twice in a row. Yeah. So, uh, the tiles are up in the upper uh, top there. Those are the tiles that you're drafting all game long. The far left, that's the those are the victory points. That's kind of like your game clock timer. When those run out, the game's over. 
Um, and then the bottom, very bottom part of that diamond there are the specialty tiles. Those are limited in, there's only one of each. So if you see one you really like, buy it as soon as you can because another opponent could buy it out from underneath you. Artwork's great. I love, love, love Queen Games. I love their components. You know, they're always, uh, in my opinion, they're always higher quality. They have that, like, that linen finish to their cards. They have the linen finish to the tiles. Um, everything about this was, was really good. The colors were striking. Um, I thought that it was a, a good use of the footprint of your table, right? It's not super, super big, and everybody has their own little plateau that they're building, things like that. So that... Is, it's intriguing to me, actually, because I like that mechanism because it's basically San Juan, that whole I take an action, I get the bonus, you lot get you yep. know, some other little bit from it. So I like that already. It does look nice. Uh, I'm not quite sure where this comparison of being like Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea is, because isn't that like the monster no, epic not... 4X game? I'm not sure. What no, I'm not seeing that either. That one. Uh, but now that but... you have that close up, uh, you can see those little squares are for inhabitants. At the end of the game, you will score points for every one of your squares that are full, every one of your inhabitants that are on the squares, every one of your closed off cities. Like there's a multitude of ways to score points. So you can try to just generate points by having specific yeah. tiles generate points by having the most inhabitants, generating the most points for having completed islands on your board. So it's it's not just like, well, this is the one strategy and go at it. You can actually adapt mid game to see if somebody's outpacing you and like chase a different strategy to try to win. Huh. I have to look this one up because uh, one thing actually, Queen Games actually, would, you could probably make a top 10 hidden gems just be Queen Games because they really <laughs> don't make a big deal about a lot of their games when they release. And when uh, many of them release, they, I think Lydian kind of, uh, I don't know, David sums it up pretty well, actually. This is kind of my shtick, um, my feeling with Queen Games. They have a lot of games I'm interested in playing and can like, but not yeah. necessarily buy them. Like, you know, you play a lot of Queen Games titles and they go, well, this is nice, this is charming, but would I buy it? And it never right. seems to go as far as buying it, with one exception, we'll get onto that later. But uh, in fact, even when you talk about how you score on these islands, that's actually similar to another game on my list later as well. So there's, nice. there's certainly some similarities mechanical wise, but I'd like to look that up. Yeah, Queen Games, you know, I, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything from Queen Games that I active. Oh, wait a minute. Did Queen Games do Kingdom Builder? Yeah. All right, I hate that one. But so, <laughs> I think generally Queen Games haven't done games that I actively hate. I think Kingdom Builder is probably the exception. <laughs> so, yeah, but I'll have to look that one up. I mean, I've, I've yeah, heard it's... of it. I've seen a cover and probably just looked at it and gone, okay, fine. And then no one's buzzed about it. So it, it passes me by. So yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. That's actually a game that I play, um, well, I say virtually. Like you could play virtually with me on my physical table. Um, it's yeah. one of those games where I set up here and, and we can play via internet. So if you ever, if you can't find it locally, you want to play it, you let me know. I have to do that. Is that we'll, we'll make certain we get the uh, time zones right on that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> won't be quite as painful though on that one there. Uh, then he mentions like if someone's got a quadropolis feel to it. Uh, I don't know. You take a tower, you put it on your map. I guess similar, I mean, filling I guess, out your like, map, I guess, but. Well, you're not restricted doesn't... like you are in Quadropolis, right? You have to use the the number three guy and take three tiles away, or and it has to go in the three row or three column. Yeah, you don't seems... have those restrictions in Skylands. This one seems a little bit more, shall we say, like free going in that. Uh, yes, I don't see why that wouldn't be too bad. All right, cool. Right, moving on to sevens. I'll take note of the timestamps. Ready. Uh, number seven for me is scrolling up. Ah, yeah. Th now, this one I think actually definitely fits better for a hidden gem. So, if people are going to give me guff for <laughs> your list being more accurate than mine, this give them one. Guff. Uh, uh, no, don't give me guff. Well, actually, they will. <laughs> they just will anyway. Particularly any Kingdom Builder fans after my last comment. But now, this one ranked 3605. So, we're actually now in your territory of uh, games we're talking about here. <laughs> now, you're and... now you're talking. And even more weird for people, this is, well, all right, it's got trains in it, but it's not like your typical 18xx train game. You know, people know what I'm like with train games. But honestly, this pick up and deliver train game is not really talked about. I got it cheap on the second hand sale. I don't think I've seen anybody sell it new. But from R&R &R Games 2014, I was actually surprised by Spike. This is practically never heard of. Nobody really talks about this one. Nope. But it is basically a ticket to ride level rule set of pick up and deliver. Yes, it has trains, 
I know that's shocking with me, but I don't mind pick up and deliver in the train sort of market, you know, because you could replace it with taxis, bus, whatever. It doesn't matter with those spaceships. But this one doesn't have shares or nonsense in it. But try to find a good uh, sort of picture of it. So you've got the map board and each city on it has got a different good. You start off with a basic train and a couple of goods cards. So like get from this per this place to this place, deliver it, get some money. Uh, but the turn sequence is very much in a sort of sense of ticket to ride. So you've got these cards here on the side that you collect a bit like the ticket to ride style, except they correspond to the types of tracks on that board. You can't see it very well unless I get a close up uh, image of it. But you notice that there are different colors and styles. So you have to get the cards to match. But you can also trade like several in as a wild that kind of thing and you know so that bit's nice and easy your train always moves unless you actually spend a turn to stop it and change direction which is different because you've actually got a physical train that you're moving on this map eventually uh, let me see if i can find a there you go gets a few more bits on there You've got a little market at the top, which constantly fluctuates. So when you go to a particular city, you'll get one, two or three dollars if you go there at the right time. So there's kind of like a, almost like a timing aspect. Like, you know, you know, you want to go to a city, but I'm like, hang on, I'll just wait for you to go shift the market a bit. Right now I'll go, I'll get a bit of extra money. So very simple bits like that. But then you've got this idea of the train, you know, everybody's building the tracks. They could get in your way. You've got a ticket that you can do much like ticket to ride like if i connect up chicago to illinois or something i'll get points you've got the goods that you're delivering for points uh production quality is a little bit so so but you do get a little train that you move on the tracks which is quite cool but you can also upgrade your train so you can make your carriage bigger to hold more goods you can make it so that your train moves faster every round and so on and so forth so but that costs you points because money is points Okay. So you, you could have a really good funky train, but how long did it take you to build up that train? And did you spend too many points to do it? You know, yeah. Maybe somebody has been really good with this little market here and has got a leg up on there. And even the end game timer is different. So you have, there's a little market there. You probably won't be able to see it unless I find a picture of it, but you've got these whistle cards that are in the deck of cards here. And as each one comes out, it basically marks a round. Oh, yeah. But as soon as that, I think you get to like the last third of the deck and then these three whistles start coming out. And as soon as the third one does, that's it. Game over. It doesn't matter whose turn it is. So you've got that added bit of tension. Like I'm almost done. I just need a bit of time. Uh Oh, <laughs> and then the whistle comes out and suddenly you're scared. It's, I didn't expect to like this one at all. Cause I thought, Oh my God, the production quality is a little iffy. It's a train, but let's go with it. And I think I just kind of fell in love with just how simple it was. Yet I had choices to make. And it wasn't like your typical train game that I would normally rag on like crazy. <laughs> okay, so so your trail of trains I saw um, on the board, you, is, is that your tracks or is that your train? It's your tracks. So you've got a little train piece that can actually slot onto the piece and move it along. Got you're it. building the track using those like routes on there. So you don't have to stick to the black route, but I might have only picked up certain track cards. So I might have to like steer off in various directions. Okay. You know, and like the goods are important because I might have to deliver this pig. So I've got to go to here, but then on route, I'm like, well, I got to deliver the pig to there, but hang on, if I just detour and do this oil, that's where three bucks if I go do that right now. Well, if, you, if so you're curious, like, oh. I'm sitting right where that corn is above the pig. <laughs> well, there. That's where, I, that's where I live. All right. <laughs> so, I, can't read, I can't read the name. <laughs> Yep, ah, right in there. Zoom. So okay, so you that is unique. You're right. So you're laying track and moving a train about and making deliveries. That's that's kind of cool. Yeah, the then we've got the well, there's train in the background there, but I mean the train can sort of slot onto these little pieces. Yeah, it was just like I say production quality, meh. But it's definitely I say your reaction kind of says it all. Nobody's heard of this one, and more people are surprised that I would like any train game, let alone so, have um, it on my shelf. Paul in the chat says only 588 have rated it in BGG. So only 588 people have, mm. you, have, you better get in there if you haven't rated it yet there, uh, Luke. I've, no, I've, I've rated it, I'm one of those 588. I, think I, I can't remember what I rated it, seven, I think I rated it seven or eight or something. It's like, yeah, but I mean, considering a lot of train games would be a lot lower than that. So yeah. it kind of makes an net. And yeah, it does have a ticket to ride for, I mean, the turn sequence and the rule set is pretty much ticket to ride. Though. This is your ticket to ride, pick up and deliver game. You know, try and find me a simpler pick up and deliver game that's more enjoyable and certainly I'd be interested to 
to know. And I love that, Paul, has said, um, you were going to give me guff for Kingdom Builder, <laughs> but Spike, sa I saved myself with Spike. So, uh, yeah. Nice save. <laughs> so yours? Oh, all right. So I'm down to 4,608. Another mm -hmm. anime feel. This is also designed by Kuro, who was uh, part of the design team for the Unicornist Knights. Uh, this is published by TMG, and it's a little worker placement um, set collecting card kind of game. And this is a small one here called Ars Alchemia. Now, that's -A definitely hidden. I'm not, I don't know how you even spell that one. <laughs> All right. Let's give you ARS and Alchemia, A-L-C-H-I-M-I-A. -A. So this one, I like how compact right. it is. For starters, love the art. Again, it's very anime influenced. It's definitely, and so it's you've just, definitely got an, uh, I mean, is that going to be a r running theme for your list then? Uh, yeah, two words. Ours space alchemia, no E. Uh, I'll try and I find got you. it. But yes. <laughs> I got you. Um, yeah, I, I do like, well, again, these are hidden gems, right? I have, as you can, again, in my collection, you see all the normal stuff. But I think some of these things go under the radar. Um, so, Ars Alchemia. He has, I'll just, since I have it out. Spell, sp spell that one again. <laughs> absolutely. The first word is A-R-S. A-R-S. And the second word ah. is, is A-L-C-H. Okay. okay, I, I think I found it. I-A. There you go. There we go. <laughs> all right, publishers, name your game something that people can spell and pronounce. All were, right? you, uh, <laughs> were you putting an E on the end of that A-R-S? That's what it was, wasn't it? Uh, no, I just could not tell what it was spelt like. I mean, it's as I say, publishers need to make these easier to find. So no wonder this is hidden. I mean, I okay. can't search for it ever because I wouldn't know how to spell it by you just telling me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a problem. So uh, it is a it is a town of um, alchemists. Basically, you are in charge of an alchemy factory and those uh, your workers. Right. So you've got this little worker placement game. Uh, they go on the board. I don't know what kind of. Uh, Pictures they show of the board, they show a lot of the art. Those are they let's show see. A lot of the rule sets, if nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there we go. Perfect. This is that's the whole board. And I mean, that board fits in a box that's the size of what, two of my hand? Like it fits in here. I was gonna to say give you an idea. Four... Yeah, it has to be. Yeah, not very big. Um, in the upper right hand corner of the board, that's where you're gonna place your workers to gather resources. One of the fun places about this, uh, uh, fun things about that, those places is I place two workers there and you want to go there. You say, oh, no, I'm going to place three workers there and kick my workers out. Your opponent can say, no, I'm going to place four workers there and kick your workers out. Whoever bids the most workers gets the space. That sounds exactly like Keyflower. Okay. Once you're there, you have to roll. You won't be able to see it in this picture, but it's okay. At the bottom, it's telling you what dice you need to roll, fives or sixes. Um, to four or fives or sixes or whatever it is you need to get to generate the resources. Okay. The more people you have there, the more bonus you get to your die rolls. So the more you send, the more possibility is going to get those resources. You use those resources to craft alchemy potions that you get at the bottom of the board, which are kind of like your job cards, if you will. Like you mentioned your recipes in Coffee Roaster. Yeah. It's your recipes in this game that gets you the victory points. They have A recipes, B recipes, and C recipes. A are easiest, B is middle, C is hardest. Um, if you collect the most A's, you get bonus points. If you collect the most B's, so that's the set collecting part. So you also have to bid workers to go down and get the recipes. You can't just, you don't just send them to get the resources. You have to bid workers to bid on recipes. You have to bid workers to bid on mixing the recipes at the factory. And then the bottom left-hand corner of the board, you can bid workers to try to get assistance that maybe they help you with your die rolls or they help um, help you stay on the board when somebody's trying to kick you off the space. Mm -hmm. They all, you know, have various different things that assistance can do. Um, so why is this one, so why is this one like, got, like for, for getting like, the whole rule set, so why is this one a gem? Why is it a gem? Okay, so I like it a lot for the following reasons. Uh, what do I have in my notes here? Um, I love the outnumber mechanic. That's one of my favorite things is where, where I, if I want to take a space, I can spend as many workers as I want. I'm going to get that space. The difference in my opinion in this game is I don't really overpay because if I send 
a bunch of workers, I'm, I'm at least rewarded by doing that too, by getting extra bonuses to my die rolls and extra chances in generating the effects. Where in other games, if I outbid you for the space, all I get out of it is getting the space. I don't get anything for sending more people than you did. Yeah. Right. Um, then the other thing is where if, if I need a certain number of victory points, so in the bottom right corner, those are the uh, recipes that you can see there, the, the red, yellow, and green. Yep. So those spaces are also biddable. So I can, I can bid on the exact number of victory points that I need round by round by round. Uh, it's, there's a lot, there's a lot yeah. of thinking involved in this game. Um, yeah, it's, give, it's given me like a very big key flower vibe with the sense of that bidding thing. And then it, even though in terms right. of points, it sounds almost a bit like, I guess, a potion explosion or splendor type thing. It's like, I need these potions, which I'll then trade in for this card that's worth XVP based on what right. I've got. So it's like the, the, like the goal of what you're trying to do sounds simple enough, but how you actually get from A to B sounds like the tricky bit. <laughs> right. I didn't notice oh, it's Taste yeah. Mitchell games as well, which I didn't expect. Yeah, the other interesting thing is the is the turn order. Um, when you have your turn order card, whoever's going first gets the least amount of workers to start with. Whoever's going last gets the most amount of workers. So you you actually generate your pile of workers by choosing your turn order, and you bid for that as well. Um, that pile of workers on the left hand side, kind of in the middle of the board, that's where your workers get sent when they get outbid. So they kind of just have to stand around and do nothing because they got. They got outbid, so you don't want that happening either. You really have to take care in how many people you send and where. So, fair enough. Oh, definitely a hidden one because I've never heard of it. Although I doubt anybody would have ever found this one uh, because, what about, yeah, I mean, I like this one. Yeah, never heard of it, and I have no chance of spelling it. Well, that was pretty <laughs> much me down to a T, wasn't it? I so, found it at Origins, actually. And the translation. Looking at the box, the transliteration is Aruso Arukimia, which to be fair, doesn't seem any easier to spell. I, was saying, I don't know what that, 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 that's so. helping you. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll deal with that. Uh, very quick before we quickly get move, move on. How many games do you each own? Last time I did a shelf by shelf series last year, I owned just over 200. That might have gone down a little bit because as I've expanded certain games, others have had to leave, but we're probably still looking at around the 180 to 200 mark in my case. What about you? 396. Say is that most people have got bigger libraries than me. It's because I've only got so much space. We have tiny buildings in the UK. You, all you Americans have got like mansions and giant <laughs> caves for rooms, and you know you could that that library behind you is like barely like like a third of that wall in that room. I suspect. I suspect there's like a mini bar to the right of that, as well as a, you know a PC setup or something. Because like you got you, you've got like rooms designed for board games, whereas I'm having to go like I can just about fit this tiny little box in there if I just squeeze it in enough it's, like, it's always a pain. Uh, Michaela says 180 including expansions. Yeah, this that's not uh that's not including expansions for me. If it's it's well over 100 or 400 with expansions for myself. Yeah, mine's not including expansions either. There's like some smaller games in the other room and that. I mean, uh, like I say I can't do another shelf by shelf series because it took forever, but I mean at the end of the day, I'd be happy with a collection of 50 games if it was 50 I was playing all the time because it's a nightmare trying to play this many games. For for what it's worth, that's how I found you, by the way. Oh, Your shelf, shelf by shelf, shelf series. series. That was yeah, that was a good fun series and it still remains popular, but yeah, it's not one I need to update every single year because <laughs> it took a hey, long That shelf time. changed. You got to do a whole new series. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't do that. Ready, move on to sixes. Okay, there. Fifth, so number six on my front. Yeah, most people haven't heard of this one either. So with this one, people might have heard of a game called uh, Pioneer Days. And that one is generally more well known. But... The one that people haven't heard of as much is Old West Empresario. This one did not get a lot of buzz when it came out. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, kind of like a side look. I'm getting a slight echo on your side, I think. But uh, we'll see. <laughs> not too bad. But um, with Old West Empresario, TMG again, funny enough. So they've got some hidden stuff. This is the sequel to Pioneer Days. So it's a dice drafting game. But this is when you're building up the city. Pioneer Days, you were going on the trail. Now you're you know, building up the actual city. But you draft the dice from these displays up here, you take the tiles and each building scores points or activates in different ways depending on the type of building. That bit's straightforward enough. The thinky part is trying to combo these buildings together because you might have like these, like these teepees are better in a big group. Some of them don't want to be next to each other, etc. But the dice drafting part is really cool. I'm trying to 
the pictures on this are extremely limited, which doesn't help. But let's see if I load up this one. That's probably better. Here we go. So you ro the dice are rolled to begin with. They're put on these bits, and they've got two tiles underneath. Now, when you take a die, you either take one of the building tiles and put it in your city, or you activate every building in your city with that die number on it. So you might build your city up to have something happen every time you take a die, but you won't get as much powerful actions because you might only have like one building with a one on it, one building with a five. But you might decide to build your city up so that you've got a lot of stuff that activates as long as you take a two die. Problem is, you might not have a two die out there. Somebody else might try and nick it first, but you're like, if I can just grab a two die in the draft phase, I can activate my whole city and get a pile of stuff. And you know cool. you can decide how you want to do it there's a lot of effects which is the one downside that i think may have put people off like when you're trying to figure out what half of this stuff does there is a player aid but yeah it's a whew, it's a it's quite a a, a smorgasbord of so, some iconography and effects you've got to bear in mind but the rule set is pretty straightforward so once you conquer that barrier you're in with a pretty decent city builder and i like dice drafting yeah there's a there's an old West game that that this reminds me of. The name escapes me. It's in my collection somewhere, at the bottom of my shelves. But um, it has to do with a train starts to roll through town. When the train gets to the top, it's not a train game. The train is the timer. <laughs> um, <Good. laughs> yeah, every at the end of every round, the train shows up, shows up, shows up. When it gets to the top of the city, it, the game is over. That's all the train does. But uh, I like this Deadwood. I think is the name of that one. Ah, um, uh, I've heard of that one. Yeah. Yeah, so but the Deadwood is zero dice drafting, which I really like that about this one. Oh, but that, and yeah, say Western Tiny Towns, uh, it's not too far off. I mean, you don't draft dice in that one, but it is, I, I mean, Tiny Towns is definitely a lot simpler than this one. This one, <laughs> you've got to pay attention to your spatial awareness quite a bit. Tiny Towns, it's kind of like wooden piece on the spot, and the buildings are already denoted or saying, here, the buildings you have in your city are entirely denoted by what you draft. So yeah. it, it kind of gets that. That's you mentioned, no, is... I'm sorry, you mentioned rela uh, spatial relation, like sometimes if you put the thing next to the wrong thing, you lose points or something? Uh, this, well, I mean, this in here, the saloon, um, I think that ability is something like you get a coin or a point uh, for every saloon that's next door, or it might be distillery that's next door. It's something like that. So, okay. you know, you want certain buildings to be next to others. But then in a negative case, there's one that I think is a cemetery. Um, or the graveyard undertaker's office, I think it is. And yeah, who wants the to be there? <laughs> and as I say, the undertaker doesn't want to be next to certain buildings. Otherwise, it's negative points. So yeah, there's some aspects. Some of them don't care about where they go dice-wise. Like these green ones here, it doesn't matter what die value you are because they don't have one. But to score points, you need to have them all in one big consecutive group. Okay. So your building knows that. Now it's a neat little one. I mean, I've got Pioneer Days on the shelf. I bought this one as well, liked it. Z Garcia was a big fan in that. And this one, as I say, most people only hear of this one or Pioneer Days because they've seen my top 100. Other than that, they probably haven't heard of either game, let alone this one. Yeah. Yep. A lot of dice, uh, a lot of dice drafting love in the, in the chat as well. <laughs> it's popular. <laughs> yeah, it is that. Well, um, since we're going dice drafting, it's funny that that was where my next one was too. Oh, <laughs> uh, not that game, but a different one. The, okay, this is probably the craziest story of buying a game ever. Have you ever bought a game, but you didn't know how much you paid for it? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm an accountant. You think I don't check money when I'm buying something? No, well. Okay, to be fair. <laughs> all right, so it was a Kickstarter. But the Kickstarter, I had to write this down in my notes because I still don't remember the type of currency. Swedish Krona. The Kickstarter yeah. was only in Swedish Krona. But when I looked okay. at the game, I was like, it can't cost that much, right? It was 290 Swedish Krona. I'm like, wow, right. that seems, I don't know. I want it. So I bought it. <laughs> it came yeah. out to like, I don't know, $27 plus shipping. So like at the end of the day, but I had no idea. Uh, designed by Tobias Hall, published by All or None Games. This is Dicetopia. Okay. D-I-C-T. D-I-C-E-topia. Now, this game is kind of set in like very synth, neon 80s, uh, you know, dystopia, right? Is what they're kind of going for here. It yeah, is, this is not uh, the cover I was expecting to see. Yeah, <laughs> it's this one right here. Tiny little, tiny little thing, as you can see. That's That's the other reason. Like, I knew... Like this couldn't cost much, so I wasn't too worried about pulling the pulling the trigger on the uh, 
right. <laughs> on the spend there. <laughs> um, you're going to roll a lot of dice at the beginning of the game, and that's it. So you don't roll uh, dice all the time, but you do roll a ton of them. The difference in this game is everybody has a player board that uh, is unique to their faction, if you will. There, there, there's a couple examples there. The city board is in the dead middle, and that when you start the game, you roll all those dice and you fill them in randomly, like uh, one at a time. So the side and the color all matter. So whether it's a three blue or a five purple and all that kind of thing. Um, you can see the orange player in the bottom right corner. He has little orange cubes. Those are his agents. When he wants that purple three in the dead middle, he'll take that agent and swap that purple three for his agent. He, he'll then have two agents of influence in that part of the city. You're mixing having area control in the city with your gang's colors, if you will, with having a set of dice collected on your board that is um, for your little you got secret mission cards here. Um, it says, this one, for example, four, four victory points for every white die left on the city board. So this particular person, if I had this mission, I would want to not draft any white dice off the board. I wouldn't want to keep all the purple and blue off the board because I get points for having white left on the board. I want that on a wall. I want this on a wall. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> that is a nice picture. I want this on a wall. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, uh, art was really, really cool. So you are, you are drafting them based on your hidden mission but you're also placing your agents out on the board as such that you want to have control of those, what is it, one, two, three, the six city areas that you can see in that board up there. So those are some pictures of the special hidden missions. Then there are also scenarios in the game that says, line your boards up this way. Those are the different factions. They each have player powers, and it comes with really cool looking dice. Um, it's just a, a, this one, I really believe is a hidden gem. They have, uh, I want to say oh, two yeah, or so expansions. Like it looks like it was only sold from a Swedish Kickstarter. I'd never heard of it, but I mean, well produced for a $27 game. Although when you said how much Krona it was, I don't have a huge knowledge of Scandinavian currency, but yeah, it's like, that doesn't sound like the most expensive game in the world. <laughs> yeah. It, well, from what I see now, there's like two expansions that I have yet, yet to get, but I will get them because I, I really do enjoy this game. Um, every, every time you swap an agent for a die, you also get that city's locations ability. And they, maybe it says turn a die on your board from a two to a four or whatever, right? Um, there's just so much replayability in this because there's 10 different factions you can pick from. And then those 15 or so different scenarios you can line out, or you can just roll the dice and go random. Uh, you name it, there's a, a number of ways to, to get points. And uh, whether you want to stick to your hidden agendas or just go out and get mm. board control, it's really fun, really fun dice drafting. Fair enough. I mean, uh, it's on Tabletopia by the looks of it, so at least it's able to be tried because I'm sure yeah. nobody is going to find this game in stores anywhere <laughs> <laughs> it's like, unless you know it. Uh, right. I, I have played some of the Tiny Epic games, uh, but I've not been the biggest fan of them. I didn't particularly like Defenders and what was another one? Marauders or something? I can't remember the attacky one. I really didn't like Tiny Epic Galaxies. I've yet to try Tiny Epic Quest. That's the one, the Zelda ripoff one by the looks of it. <laughs> you know, might be a good one. I don't know. I've just never got into this whole gimmick of, oh, look, our game's so tiny. Look how tiny we can make the box. It's like, yeah, but your game really should be in a bigger box. It's like the size does not stop me buying a game. <laughs> yeah, I've played... I've just played Tiny Epic Defenders. Um, I, I had somebody have me try to play Tiny Epic Zombies, and they wanted to fit the little things in the little things, and everything got smaller. And I'm I kind of with you. Like, it just got too small for my taste. Yeah, I mean, like things like Mint Works. It's like, I don't care if you can fit it in a mint tin. If the game's <laughs> no good, I don't care. Like, Paco Gums, do you remember Paco Games? Do you remember that lot? I think they were based in your area in, in the States, and they were doing all those games that were in the size of a chewing gum packet. Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, one or two of them are decent enough, fine, and I like the idea, but it's like, I really don't need something that I can fit into my shirt pocket as a game. It's like, I don't need to be like on the move and then suddenly go, oh, wait a minute, there we go, here's my game. It's like, no, I'm prepared for these kind of things. <laughs> How many games do you have on you right now, sir? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anything to declare? Well, you know, all this. <laughs> All of those, it's like, no, it's not quite what, I mean, there's one half decent one of those, I think it's called Lie. But it's basically okay. just a mini card game version of Liar's Dice. And it's like, well, I'd rather just play Liar's Dice <laughs> and have the have those. So it's uh, kind of a bit. But no, an interesting one. That's, I mean, I love that artwork. That artwork was certainly good, but we'll have to see. Anyway, got to get move on. So Fabs. Okay, doke. So number five for me. Oops. 
I'm trying to remember where my number five is. Ah, yeah. That most. I wonder if anyone's heard of this one, though. This is a party game. Straight up party game. And the rule set pretty much makes it feel like it's a party game that even though it came out in 2016, this should have probably come out in the 90s or something. Because the, the, uh, like the rule set feels like something from there and even then you've it's got similarities to an older game but this is a great party game called hive mind uh, hmm. most people not heard this is a richard garfield game and so yeah that surprises a lot of people that no one's heard yeah of it. but i only knew of this from my local dice cafe so they did events before they opened up where i went along and helped teach games the two people that run it that are friends of mine showed me this game i'd never heard of it and i thought Oh, well, I like party games, whatever. And as soon as I played it, it's now in the collection and I bring it out for families, but also at conventions and just for new players who have not seen it. And it works with pretty much any player account, the more the merrier. It's, if you've ever played a game called Scategories, have you ever heard of that one? Oh, yes. Yeah, Scategories was the, uh, an old game where you had to, you got given a letter like, and you had to write down as many things as you could think of, beginning with that letter for a topic area. So food, beginning with P, right? Pie, pizza, you know, whatever, you know, paella. And the idea was, was that you were trying to come up with words that were different from the other opponents. You wanted to be unique to score points. This is a different game. This takes that formula and flips it completely on its head. Firstly, there is no winner. You have to not get kicked out of the hive. As long as you, it's, a, it's like Kakalak and poker, you know, it, it carries yeah. on until there's one loser. But in this one, you're instead trying to come up with clues that, well, answers that everyone will think of. So you basically roll a die, you move the queen bee along. And if I can find some examples, these are like the bees to say where you are and you're trying not to get kicked out. But come on, here we go. So double-sided cards, you can make up your own, but basically it's got things like, what are three things at a funeral? What are four overrated male actors? three women's names beginning with the letter A, that kind of thing. And then you you flip the timer and everybody in secret writes down as many things that fit that category. Well, they have to write down the exact number, but they're trying to think, well, hang on. So Amy's a good common name beginning with A, but would they think of that? Well, sure, her name is Amy. <laughs> so she's got to think of that. So I'll put down Amy. And then when that happens, everybody reveals their answers and you score a point for each person who said it, including yourself. I like it. So, so six players if five of you said it but one person didn't then you get each player gets five points for that answer and depending on where the queen bee landed at the start of the turn dictates how many low scores get kicked down a notch and it's a case of carry on until somebody is so unlike all the other bees in the hive they get kicked out the whole hive i mean it's hive mind but yeah. such a simple rule set but this causes so many laughs and stand up moments for sheer disbelief because there is so many times where you'll think you've put down the best answer ever and you'll go like, you know, right, yeah, Amy was totally good, right? So my first one is Amy. And all you hear is silence. It's like, <laughs> what? It's like, all right, well, come on. Everyone's heard of Amanda. Oh, that, seriously, guys, come on. It's like, it's like everyone starts flipping out because they yeah. think their answer's great. But then somebody will say an obscure answer, you know, and suddenly it's like, oh, yeah, I thought of that one. It's like, how did you not think of that one? It's like, and it causes so many arguments like that. that it's great. And you talk about stories. I know I sold this stream being short. We'll worry about that bit later. But the story I got with this one, we trolled the same mate who taught us, that, who showed me this, right? Yeah. Four of us were playing this and he had to go away and say hi to some people who turned up to the event. So the other three of us arranged to troll him. And the question, the clue card we were given was, um, we got told it in advance and it was a uh, name free methods of communication, right? So that would be like telephone and that kind of thing. And we came up with three stupidly obscure answers to put down <laughs> in secret that we would write down and troll him for it. And so he yeah. comes back, he sits down. And so we go through, da, 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 we do our names. And then he says his common answers like telephone or radio, or whatever. And it's just like, I thought of it, but I just thought I could, I thought of a better answer. And it's like, yeah, but does anyone really communicate by the phone these days? I mean, I text, but is, is, and we, we made up stuff like that. And then sure. we read our ones out. And I think the first one we had was something like, I don't know, like paper cup or whatever, you know, something stupid. It's like, oh yeah, we got that one. It's like, <laughs> hey. <laughs> and then the second one we had was smoke signals. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and each time we read it out, all of us are going, yep, got that, got that. And he's like, hell <laughs> can i sit back the, down at the wrong table <laughs> yeah and the third time we uh, the third one we had which was perfect was zebra four 
like the flags <laughs> and he just like flipped and just like what is going on here okay <laughs> like, this doesn't make sense slammed on the table and it's just like it's like it's all right mate we trolled you okay <laughs> these are the three answers <laughs> he just flipped out <laughs> so that's cool. great but sounds yeah, like a good honestly, time is it it's a simple cheap party game gives you the pens in the box you could make up your own clues or use these. I mean, I don't even roll the dice for her. That I mean, I start her at this space when it starts getting it. It's just such good fun for a simple party game. Never heard of it. And now it's still in the collection. I love it. Yeah, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a fan of I'm a fan of simple party games. There are some that are overdone, like Quelf, that just gets a little too... <laughs> yeah, not it's, a fan it's out there, right? But if you have a theme and you want to narrow it, like um, Wits and Wagers, right? It's decent enough. <laughs> Thomas Helms, semaphore it is. Yeah, he was going to say it. So, and hello, Hexy Beast has arrived, and Victory BHG as well. Ooh, we got a good number of people here, actually. This is hey, quite everybody. a good number for me. As I say, despite the uh, length of the stream and our weird start, I think everybody's like, "Yay, it's happening! We're here now!" So, <laughs> yeah, we're we're talking about the hidden. Okay, so you ready? Goes. Yep. I'm down to five thousand eight hundred and fifty-nine. Designed by Craig Zipsy and published by Kenzer and Company. Now, they haven't published a game in a lot of years. Uh, this particular game is Great Space Race. Now, you might find two. This was one that was published around 2005, 6, 7, somewhere in that area. Great Space Race. Um, okay, you are a spaceship, and you are in a uh, two-lap race around the galaxy. And this particular galaxy actually has walls that you can crash into. So, you know, the space walls that you could crash into if they did. That's the one. If they did exist. This was my first introduction into uh, pre-programmed turns. You know what I mean? You have to, like, lay out your turn in advance face down, and everybody has to do it. That is not a... That is not the back of the box I want to see when I pick up a game. <laughs> I'm telling you. A Star this Wars scroll of tidy text. That's not a good start. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So... You've got there's the there's the galaxy. Ah, my eyes. <laughs> yeah, everybody's everybody's spaceship has a unique player power, so that's that's kind of fun. Um, the three dials on your ship, you see blue, orange, and green. There, you have your shields, your hull, and your uh, and your speed. The faster your speed is, the more cards you can lay down for your maneuvers. So if you're going full speed, you get five turns per round. If you're going uh, the slowest speed, you always have to put two cards, two moves down per turn. Um, if you're going max speed, you're going to go, basically every round is done on counters, one, two, three, four, and five. If you're going slowest speed, you go on uh, like three and five, for example. Everybody moves, if, you, if you're going the right speed, you go on one and you turn your card over if you have a card there. If at any time at the end of those you are overlapping, you have to roll for collision. And if you have good shields and they don't, you're going to ram them and hey, they take damage. You can drop little space mines. That's what those little square chits are. Those are mines along the board. And if they if Mario their movement Kart crosses over it, <laughs> right? Yeah. So um, again, pre-programmed movement. So the cards you're putting face down have hex-based maneuvers uh, <laughs> like that. And you're just you're just going around two laps, but it takes like an hour and a half to get around two laps of the board, but it's Seems a lot a of fun. Long. Those the ships. There's about ten or twelve different ships to choose from. Um, there are uh, special like weapons Gee. you can get through doing during certain actions, and everybody's ship again has a special power. Do you um, design the tracks based on these tiles? Do you like pre-design the track? They are yeah, they're multi-sided. So you I've can seen several track layouts, and yep. I can't imagine you've got that many boards. So no, you must have uh -uh. to build the walls with this. Right. Yep. But I mean, it sounds the theme of it sounds up my street, but I could not stare at that board. I mean, I mean, somebody actually, the Hexy Beast made a really good comment. Actually, it does look like an F Zero track. <laughs> yeah. Remember that old game? Is that it yep. looks like that and. You know, like a 90s arcade game, that's what it is. But I think my eyes would just bleed out if I had to stare at that all the time. It's like the graphic yeah. design on this, I think, needs a bit of a makeover. <laughs> Funny enough, the uh, well, keep in mind the year, right? This was 2000. What did it say? 2000 and... I didn't see, actually, because I skipped a bit. Uh, the Great Space Race. Uh, 2006. Six. I think we could... I mean, 15 years ago, it could use a facelift. You actually spend yeah. less time looking at the map and more time planning out your um, your ship's board because you got to keep an eye on your speed and your hull and your weapons um, well, at some point you need to be able to see your ships i mean i can barely see the i didn't even notice there was a pink ship there 
<laughs> until I stared closely. So it's, yeah. It's a, it, oh God, that's it, like even. So there's some people track. linking a couple of games together. I couldn't imagine. I've never done that. But oh, I was gonna say the premise sounds good. I think this is one of those ones that I just think that, that needs a visual makeover for modern day. <laughs> And then sweet. But yeah, I think I would probably give myself a headache if I tried to stir that board like crazy. But definitely a hidden one. And is that, I mean, how did you even come across this one? Okay, so my background is I used to actually own and operate, uh, my wife and I owned and operated a game store for a dozen or so years in Southern California. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that was during this time. It was from 2002 to 2012, I guess, so 10 years. Uh, and come across it then at a Gamma convention Back then, Kenzer and Company was putting out quite a lot of games. They put this out. They put out Dwarven Dig. They put out Fairy Meat. They um, they were at the height of role playing at the time with a game called Hackmaster, which was a parody on an Advanced Dungeon and Dragons. Uh, they were they were kicking it uh, in the game space then. That was that was also during the time when AEG was more a card uh, CCG company, uh, L five R Warlord, right? All Spycraft, all those games. So it was in that era, and I just. Brought this out, and there's somebody having some fun, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, well, with the tie ship, fighters and well, the, the ships look a lot better already. I mean, <laughs> I can see them. <laughs> uh, uh, so, it, it's an interesting one. I mean, I, I, I would, if if it gets a visual makeover, I try it or something. I, that seriously, for I mean, 2006, I think they could still improve that because it, it's it's kind of got that feeling of Zyre prototype stage in a sense it's like sure. <laughs> before before that got blinged out but uh i mean the concept of a space race sounds fun and i would probably play it just for the sake it's a racing game i do like that genre but yeah just i can't stare at that board <laughs> imagine if that glue in the dark or something and it was like that i was like ah <laughs> I can't take yeah it. that would be painful oh i would be mad but yeah that's, that's definitely an interesting one anyway <laughs> so i don't know if it's going to get a, a mad rush of people sort of hunting it down but <laughs> <Doubt it. laughs> we'll see <laughs> I doubt it do. All right, uh, what was that? That was five, so let's move on to four. So on my four, right, here we go. Number four, is it a hidden one? Oh, yeah, now, when you were talking about Skylands before, um, I mentioned that there was a game that used one of your mechanics in there. You know where you put the people on the little squares and it scored you points for various things? Yep. All right, well, this has got a similar thing with the huts, but I've been banging on about this game, ranked 2955, as this is what killed Carcassonne for me. So I culled Carcassonne out of my collection. This is the game that did it, and that is Small Islands. Okay. This one, I came across it at random at UK Games Expo. I got called over to a booth, Mushroom Games, I think it was. Yeah, mush I think it was Mushroom Games, or it might have been some other side distributor, but never heard of them. I think it was... Um, like Asian based at that uh, from what it was because they had some other Asian games there that I tried and I'd never heard of this one but that cover drew me in at first I thought um whatever I'm playing here it's going to be nice and pretty and it is a Carcassonne style game so you have got uh, very much a Carcassonne style gameplay so draw a tile play a tile create the map except you do it from a face-up display. You have a couple in your hand, but you take one from a face-up display. So you've got choices as to which one to put out. Um, but there's a few key differences. You have an objective card at the start of the round that you decide out of several which one you're going to have. And it will say score points for various icons and islands. And then you create the map. But then when you're creating a map, you have the opportunity to put little houses on the island in little spots, a bit like your Skylands one. And then when the round ends, you score those houses based on where, how they match your card. So these little things like the lotus leaves, the orange bit, the temples, the little green leaves there, your objective score based on that. You can mix and match some of these tokens to change the layout of the islands. But the round doesn't end until the deck, like the initial deck runs out of tiles to begin with. And somebody plays a ship tile. And the ship tile can score points at the end for these harbor symbols, but obviously it's surrounded by water, so it can only go somewhere. But you only have one of those in each game for a four player. If you've got multiple players, if you've got less players, you've got neutral ones. But it means that if you do it in, like, say, round one, you don't get to decide when the round ends in the rest of the game. Somebody else has to. So, and you don't know whether somebody else will end the round quicker than you will. So you're kind of thinking, well, I want to build this island up and up, but then. I need to actually think, oh, so-and-so is getting a good island as well. Maybe I should end the round. So it's a nice little timing aspect. But the it looks gorgeous when you start creating it. It's an archipelago island. 
It sure. has a lot of similarities to Carcassonne, but with a little bit more meat to it. Mm -hmm. And it's even got a good solo mode where you've got an Automna that places tiles based on one of five different difficulty level personality cards. So they go for certain things or play in a certain style. And that works pretty well as well. I think I did a, I'm not sure if I did a solo playthrough of it. Or, no, I might have just done a review for the game, but it's neat. Lightweight, you can play it on Board Game Arena. I recommend people give this one a try because pretty much no one had heard of it. <laughs> cool. And tell me again, the tokens you said you, you can change the tokens change the makeup of the island? Yeah, the you've got these little tokens. Uh, um, is it those tokens? No, that's discovery tokens. No, there's. I think everybody gets a certain amount of them in the game. And at the end of your turn, you have the opportunity to, say, replace one symbol with another. Um, oh, but you've okay. only got so many, so they're kind of your game limit. Uh, that can be slightly annoying. But as I say, it's, it's a case of like, because the other restriction is that you can only have one of your buildings on an island. So once you've scored that island in a particular round, you can't score that island at all for the rest of the game. Ah. So you have to start building up a different island. So you can't put... So if you put all your eggs in one basket into this giant island, yes, it will score you great now, but then you haven't got any decent islands to build up again in the next round. So you got to kind of you know, spread yourself out a bit. But of course, okay. there's limited spaces to put your buildings. I mean, you might have tons on an island or the island might be so small, it's only got two spots on it. Hmm. And other people might nick them before you. It's just yeah. a... It's a very neat little game. Like where if try it on board game arena, I would say that's the best way to find it and learn it at this point. Although I think Lucky Duck Games might be distributing this now. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. Isn't it? Isn't it the best when you go to these conventions and somebody kind of pulls you aside and you, uh, should I or how fine? And you sit down and you're like, man, I'm really glad I stopped there and played that. I was going to say at first that's not always the case where you sort of get dragged and you can't say no and it's like, oh, there's better be right. good. But then yeah, when you do find that hidden gem. You know, similar to the coffee roaster one. When you do find that gem, it's definitely worth it. Yep, absolutely. That's that's one of the best feelings ever. All right. So All right. Um, Cooper Island has got no similarities to this whatsoever. I had it. I reviewed it. I've got rid of it. It's fine. It's just a bit restrictive in one note. <laughs> mm, yeah, I've not it's... played that one. <laughs> nope, right, not yours... Cooper Island. Um, okay. 6,263. We're digging, scraping that barrel. <laughs> well, this I one? think some of your choices have already been doing that in the sense like no one's heard <laughs> of them ever. <laughs> like, I can't even say if they're bad games or not because I've just never seen them. <laughs> All right, well, see. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, this one's designed by Tyler Bierman. He actually has another game that's even further down, like in the 11,000s. Uh, Tyler Bierman. This was published by WizKids, and this is Oshi, O-S-H-I. Oshi, again, not one I've heard of. <laughs> um, it's called Oshi, the Game of Influence, and the components uh, are very few. I think there's, let's see, 10, 11 components, and that includes the rule book. Oh, so it's like a so, little abstract game. There's the board, there's the rules, and Hold there's the pieces. On. Hold on, let me get you on solo layout. Should oh, I sure. So the board, oh, look at that, green screen, huh? Rules upside down. Okay. And uh, the picture you had there, that's the pieces. I will say, solid, like this is solid wood. It's not break, some- Break it over your opponent's head when you lose. Oh, <laughs> if you lose, yeah, now we're talking influence, right? So the gist of the game is you to score seven points. And those that building right there, if you wanna go back one picture real quick. That building right there, the red one, is worth three points because it, is, it has three roofs. The one next to it is worth one point because it only has one roof. The buildings that are size three can push three pieces up to three squares. The size twos can push two pieces, two squares. The size one can only push one piece, one square. Okay. Uh, forward, backward, left and right only, no diagonal. And in my opinion, that's the beauty of the game. It's because that's all. That is the rules. Well, okay, oh, yeah. there's one more. You can't go back and forth, back and forth. Like you have yeah, to move I mean... some... That's the great thing with these little two-player abstract games. I mean, I've got things like Yinch and Onitama and stuff, and it's just uh, like Kamasado. Teach it in two seconds, play it, and it will burn yes. your brain out. Uh, I must admit, it does remind me a little bit of Shogi. I don't know the full rules to it, but I mean, back on mm. the anime front, I watch uh, Naruto and all that yeah. lot, and like two characters play Shogi all the time, and yeah, it's giving me that kind of vibe. Yeah, orthogonally. Thank you. That was the word I was trying to remember. Uh, <laughs> orthogonal yeah. only. And there is a... There's a special reason this is on my hidden gems list. 
this game uh, got me to play more games with my kids than any other game because they got it. Like it's it's not hard. Like yeah. you push seven points of your opponent's pieces off the board and you win. They oh, could so that's grasp what you're trying that. to do. You're trying to push them off, right? Okay. Yep, all the way off the edge. So there were times, you know, you could you could topple somebody two, three, four points at a time because you're pushing them with your size three piece, and it's mm -hmm. just so clean, right? It's kind of it's kind of elegant. And I don't know, just a lot to like about it. And that's yeah. my, uh, it's my number, what am I, four? Yeah, it's my yeah. number four. I just yeah, think I wonder, any game. I wonder why that's, I wonder why that's so, because this sounds like a pretty decent abstract game. I'd certainly play it. Uh, yeah, I wonder why it's it not is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Until the any cat game for me, well, even it's so good the cat can play it. <laughs> any game for me that helps me introduce games to others, I think rates pretty high too. Like if they grasp it, enjoy it and want to play different games, like, mm -hmm. hey, can we play something like that thing we played the other day? And then they want to branch out. I think that's a great win for board games in general. Mm. And it's easier than teaching your kids chess, but I mean, it's a nice looking game. I mean, the, the components are decent enough for an abstract. I mean, they don't need to be done. That board is certainly big and thick. It's portable. I, I, I've, it's, I've got enough two-player abstract games on my shelf, even though I don't get two-player games at the table often. I still keep them because they are just nice symbol and I enjoy them that much. This would be another one that I would happily try. So I'm curious why it's so low. Maybe it just didn't get the distribution it needed. I mean, who, who made this one? Uh, WizKids. Well, WizKids are useless at keeping their games uh, distributed. Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> not back then. I mean, that was a, I'll tell you, that was the height of Hero Clip. And it was very shocking that they put this out and they put Suro out in the same year. Oh, yeah. If you're familiar with Suro, they put both these yeah, games yeah. out in the same month, actually. Um, and that might have hurt it, too. That is, that is bad, but uh, fair enough. Oh, you see, not only have we got to, as I say, we've already had Mikalia for a while, but <laughs> she found our group because she's in the Nerd Shelves Facebook group and Judy has now turned up from the Nerd Shelves. So it's like, yeah. Oh, got it. <laughs> Hello to you. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm in that Facebook group as well. It's nice. And I say, we did a video a few weeks back, you probably already know, and we've got another one planned eventually once we've decided on the topic and that. So uh, yeah, looking forward to that. But yeah, this Oshi one does look pretty sweet. If I see it, yeah. I'm definitely going to have a look for it. It's a fun All one. All right. Nah, fair enough. So moving on to the freeze. And my number three, we have got, what have I got on number three? <laughs> ah, yes. All right. You're familiar with a publisher called Empress 4? No. Um, do you know a game called Hanamakoji? Yes. Right. So that is one of their mainstream games that they talk about. You know, like okay. I, I, I sing the praises of that game loads. So does Sam Healy now. This one is in their repertoire. It's only about, I think Hanamakoji is something like 200 and something like it's highly rated this one's a thousand three hundred and twenty eight which doesn't seem that low but it hasn't had a huge amount of buzz but every time i bring it out no one's heard of it but i have probably deserved royalties from empress war because i swear i've convinced about four or five different groups to buy this game <laughs> shortly after i've shown it to them and it's a lovely little game that's still on my shelf called walking in barano this i love that game. game i didn't even know it's oh i that have that four Oh, AEG might have distributed it in your area, but it was Empress 4 originally. And but this one though, I honestly really nice little card game. Didn't know I love what it. to expect from it. I think this was probably my second game I played from them because I was already obsessed with Hanamakoji. And then at the same time as getting this, I grabbed a bunch of their other games like Herbalism and Shadows in Kyoto and that, because even if I don't get to play them often, they're just so small, compact, and just nice little games. Uh, but this one is probably my second favorite that they have done. I love the little kitty cat. And whether solo or multiplayer, it's just a simple concept. Build your five buildings, get the colors to be different, but obviously they've got to be the same going up, and then score points based on the, inhabit um, the inhabitants or the tourists for iconography. So green plants, multicolor plants, cats on the roof, chimneys, you know, uh, red and blue uh, tarpaulins, you know, curtains, what type of shop is there, how many people are walking by, there's all sorts of different ways to score points. But the the reason, I mean, that rule set is already good enough, and there's lots of different cards and imagery, the drafting part of this, where you've got to select them from the middle row, trying to find a decent example of the tableau bit, yeah, like here. There you go. That's the tense bit, though, because I actually played this wrong. The, I mean, Judy actually mentioned this as well. I played this wrong the first few times as well. So it's the rule book. It's easy to misinterpret it. But uh, 
I thought you could like cherry pick from lots of different bits. Like, all right, I got to take this roof. I'll take this uh, middle and I'll take that bottom one. It's like, no, that's not what you do. Um, you have to take the entire column, whether you like it or not. So it's like, all right, well, I want this pink one, but then you've also got to take that one and you've also got to take another one. It's like, ah, so you're mm -hmm. thinking, I really need this card, but then I've got to deal with these other cards that might be good for me. They might not be, but you're in a hurry to finish your buildings because you don't get to choose one of these inhabitants until you finish a building and they're in short supply. So somebody right. else might be gunning for similar iconography and it's like, oh, I need to get that one quick, you know, before somebody else nicks it. You're desperate for that, like that orange building right there and somebody takes it before you. It's like, ah, crying out loud. So like turn order is important in this. You know, you know, I, I can't remember if you choose a turn order. Or it's, just, I think it just, yeah, you pass the cap marker around. So you know if you're going to be first next round. So you got to factor that in. But it's just a nice little charming game in a tiny little box, very simple components. But nice artwork. Burano is that area, I think Italy, I've got the feeling. Uh, I think it's some area around Venice way with all these color buildings. I'd love to go visit there. And yeah. of course, it's got a tiny little cat marker as a first player marker, which automatically bumps up a point because <laughs> all cats are cool. <laughs> but you, yeah. you knew what I was talking about when I, when I showed you the picture. So obviously, you just know of it from AEG then. Yep. That's, so I'm looking at mine now on my shelf, and it's, yeah, it's AEG. I don't even see the Empress. Oh, I do see the Empress logo now that you say that. Yeah, it's a, Empress 4 was how I heard of it. And then it's like, oh, AEG picked it up. Yep. So it's like, fine, to get it more widespread. I, but yeah. I'm a complete fan of what they've done. And again, for such a small footprint on the table, right? They, yep. didn't, they didn't make it so small that it's annoying and it's not so big that you can't manage it. And it's it's such a fun such a fun time. I agree with you. The the drafting was the tense part, one hundred percent. Especially when you're doing solo, right? Don't you lose the far right cards or something at the end of the round, like something like that? Yeah. The, so you not only have to itself. you not only have to take the cards that sometimes you don't want, but you, then you also might lose cards you do want because there were other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that whole puzzle gets really really fun. Yeah, it's just a little charming card game, but nobody's heard of it when I bring it out. They enjoy it. And then the next week, I hear they bought their own copy. So, you know, <laughs> Ember S4, free game my way, please. <laughs> yeah, you need a little bell. Every time you ring it, you get uh, royalties. They'll send some meeples your way. <laughs> All right. Down to 8,524. <laughs> this is designed by John D. Clare, uh, put out by Tasty Minstrel Ooh. Games. It is, uh, I put it on my list because I wanted a heavy game. I wanted a big, thick, rich, deep. Oh, I, I thought you might have been saying uh, Custom Heroes, the trick-taking one he did or something, because I know that's relatively hidden now. But no, 8,000 heavy game? Good. Yeah. Now, funny enough, you say that about the trick-taking game. I actually almost had that on my list. Um, I, oh, didn't, it... I didn't choose it because I wanted to have something meaty, oh, and this it... one's called downfall oh yeah <laughs> i hope i get it without now, pulling my shoulder I, out this thing is heavy nah, i know the heavy. game because a friend of mine grabbed this because we were like in mystic veil um the other one he did and he showed this to me we played it and yeah, I, I think eight thousand is harsh but certainly i can see why this one hasn't been picked up a lot yeah absolutely um the things i liked are well one I, okay so to, to just kind of get this part said and out there. You have to have the deluxe version to make this fun. And it's, and, no, I don't think I did say Tasty Minstrel. <laughs> I'm fairly certain. <laughs> Is that, I, don't, I don't know, but <laughs> language uh, barrier. <laughs> you got to get this out there. To, to have fun with this one, you need the deluxe version because the tiles are pretty, well, they're not, they're, they're not small tiles, but you have to put a lot on the tiles when you're playing the yeah. game. It's a area control, right? You and I are going to fight for control of this tile. But not only that tile, that tile's broken down into like sometimes two or even three different types of terrain. Here's a good picture. Yeah. It, the grass say, and the orange part, right? So that tile has two sections. You and I can be fighting on both sections. It's mm -hmm. nuts. But the, but the deluxe tiles are huge. So what I'm driving at is I wanted to get this out front. Just don't make a smaller version that doesn't work just to sell a deluxe version that does right yeah <laughs> that's my only like if i have a gripe about the game it's that i can't remember Every, if my mate has the deluxe or not i think he does but even well let me ask you this version, did you play with cardboard ships or did you play with plastic ships i have a feeling they were plastic okay then you got deluxe right because <laughs> if you didn't they're all punch out cardboard token ships I feel, I feel uh, that like look like plastic, that but so 
I like the turn mechanic. If you remember that, you have a hand of cards yeah. and you're picking one for the turn, but then your hand gets past draft style mm. for the next round. So like, do I, <laughs> do I hate draft your turn? I don't want you taking this action, so I'm taking it away from you, but it's not suboptimal or suboptimal for me. Like, I thought that part was really, really cool in such a vast style game, right? Resource management, resource collection, a little bit of fighting. Yeah, it, David says avoiding this one too heavy. It is hmm. really heavy. That's to say, um, it, it, it was a lot heavier than I expected it to be. Uh, yeah. There was certainly a lot of meanness as well. Like, I mean, you could knock someone out pretty badly at times. And I know yeah. my friends were big fans of that. I wasn't for a long game. <laughs> but I'm, I mean, that sort of board, that's about, that's a clean looking board at the moment. It yes. can get way more cluttered than that. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it just became a bit like nightmarish to see what was going on. And uh, yeah, we definitely had these. So this particular one, um, I, the other thing I liked was that the board isn't, it is laid out, but it's laid out face down. So you legit do not know what you're heading into when you go into those face down tiles. Hmm. I think that's, that's really, really cool in an in a area control game. You normally see like take uh, Blood Rage or Rising Sun, right? The whole map is before you and you can pick and choose. Okay, well, yeah. this whole map is also before you and you can pick and choose at your own <laughs> spare, right? So <laughs> this one, I really had a lot of fun. I really hope to play it again. Um, I don't do a lot of heavy games, but I liked this one a lot. Yeah, this one had some stuff I did like in it. Uh, the meanness was probably one of the things I didn't. But I mean, the turn sequence I like, the drafting I like. I think with this one, I mean, I think this was one of his earlier designs, I think, before he started doing like the Mystic Veils and that. It's just that when you know you've got ships this big and you're fighting on tiles like this, you have to be aware that this is going to cause gameplay issues with yeah. spacing and stuff like that. He's like, you have to know this going forward. And that's going to put off a ton of people when you have your game. If your game is fiddly to maneuver, then people won't want to play it. Oh, the customizable customizable player boards. That's the other thing I really liked about it. Everybody's player, player tableau, if you will, you could upgrade uh, differently than your opponents, right? So my captain could be stronger than yours but your engineer is better than mine so stuff is cheaper for you but i'm stronger than you and i liked that about it too right there yep mm. those long lines of cards are them upgrading those different and and you do that you know individually so yeah that bit was my favorite part uh, yeah customizing my actions to do different bits so that was me there was a good 75% of this game I genuinely liked and thought this has got good things if it was a heavy thing. It's just that other 25 had the meanness factor and <laughs> the fact, well, the, the, the meanness could really decimate you if you weren't expecting it. But also just the fact that it was just such, it took a long time to set up. It was a lot to visualize on the boards when we were trying to maneuver off of these plastic pieces all over the place. I just think like downfall second edition, streamline it a bit, sort out the component spacing area, you know, you want to deluxify it like crazy and then go ahead, you know, people will be interested. Then I'm on board, like properly. <laughs> yep. As a, I think, my, I don't know if my mate still got it. I think he might have, but this is definitely, yeah, this, I mean, this is actually one you can get hold of people for a start, <laughs> unlike yeah. half of his other, half, unless, unlike <laughs> half of his other games. I, I believe you could actually go out in the store and find this one. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Because of that, because, I was say I like Don Diego stuff, although I prefer his card game stuff to. Yeah, absolutely. Mystic Veil vale is just phenomenal. Mystic Veil is a good one. All right, so that was freeze right twos. Ready? Ready? Eight. I've missed out several timestamps. This will be fun when I do this at the end of the video. But uh, <laughs> you ever try? Honestly, trust me. You ever try doing a live stream and then you've got to do like twenty to thirty timestamps? straight after the video scrolling through a two hour stream it's like it's not fun you need to write down as many as you can and half of them are there and half of them aren't so <laughs> good tip <laughs> i have fun with that <laughs> well you're all right you're on you do yours on twitch or something don't you so yep. yours is a bit more of a different story i don't think twitch ever bothers with timestamps. it's all live well but then fly, i isn't it? then i edit the video and upload it to youtube so then i gotta timestamp ah. it differently anyway <laughs> You can't escape it, but yeah, it's good to write it down if you can keep up with it and remember it. Right, but number two, small card game. Now, this one is probably the most recent game on my list. So whether it's class is hidden is another thing, but I don't see anyone else playing it. It has only recently come onto Board Game Arena. I came across it two years ago at Essen, like the last Essen we had before uh, lockdowns and that started happening. And I don't hear anybody talk about this game, but the French guy at Bombix 
taught it to me and we played a two player game of this in 20 minutes that's how quick you can get this beautiful game out and it's i mean based yeah, i say <laughs> and it's rank 1485 based on one of my favorite games of all time abyss this is abyss conspiracy the small little tiny card game version i love abyss now whether this is a hidden gem kind of depends on how people think it's hidden because <laughs> i can understand if you don't think it's that well hidden but you know if you don't know it on board game arena chances are you haven't heard of this game but this feature is not only the same artwork that i just mm. drool over from abyss oh, so good with those sushi boys just oh nice but it's a very straightforward card game you have got to build up this upside down pyramid of the different lords same factions like abyss but it utilizes as a mechanic from this where you can draw up to three cards from the deck to look at the lords, but you only pick one and the rest go face up for opponents to potentially take. So if you've played a bitch, you know the council stacks? Yep. It's a bit like that. The ones you don't the one you don't pick goes into the face up pile and people could take a stack of yellows, a stack of blues. Right. And you build your pyramid left to right and go on down. Game ends as soon as like a, a turn after somebody finishes their pyramid. So people are going at different rates because you're giving them stacks of cards if for ones you don't look at. But other than that, it's a very straightforward system of each one gives you victory points, but you only score your best Lord from each color. But yep. then on the flip side, uh, when you can get, I'm trying to find a sort of bit, ah, this is probably a good one. When you get lots of them in the same color connected, they're worth three points a piece. You get these okay. keys, which much like an abyss, you unlock these locations with different scoring opportunities, like your highest green lord, you know, special things. And you can even get pearls on some of the lords where whoever has the most pearls at the end of the game gets five points. It's a bit like the camels from Jaipur. So mm -hmm. there's that little extra. But you carry on, finish the pyramid. Everybody scores up. You can have some pretty tight games. People will go for different, you know, cards and that. But I love this idea it comes in a little tin less than 20 pound probably even less than that and it's just again i was taught it and played it in 20 minutes now granted that was two of us the guy obviously knew it but english is not his first language and i pick up games very quickly you know but it should not take you more than 30 to 40 minutes with four players teaching the game it shouldn't you know unless people are really slow um, you uh you you have got the chat blowing up about this one well done look at this this conspiracy was it me to want didn't know it existed oh yeah was it didn't they want to play this <laughs> people are there well if only it had a solo mode not everything needs a solo mode jonathan all right <laughs> some <laughs> games can survive with other people but <laughs> I, I, he does a lot of solo he's a big solo gamer like i am so it's like <laughs> but sure. to be honest i actually wish this one was solo as well but board game arena i can effectively get solo on it but yeah it's it's just like I say, you've got the beautiful cards. I The only thing I don't like about it is the fact that it comes in a square tin and when you sleeve the cards, it is a little bit like weird story in it. That's the only annoying thing because you don't want these cards unsleeved. Not with that artwork on it. Right. <laughs> you want them sleeved. But yeah, it's saying it only, it almost didn't even come out at Essen because Bombix had, and a lot of other publishers had delivery issues with their palettes. Mm -hmm. And this one nearly didn't even turn up for the whole convention. So it was kind of like all we had was a demo copy and I don't think I even got mine at the convention. I had to buy it afterwards when it came out on retail, but I don't know how easy it is to get. Hopefully you can find copies, but yeah, for the cheap price it is and that constant thinking of, right, I need to find a blue Lord, but if I draw three cards, that's two that others will pick. This works better as a two player game than it does as a four. Okay. It's a little bit more chaotic with more players with the cards that come out. But yeah, two player, this one shines like crazy and I'll still play with three or four. It's just, you've got to bear in mind that slight extra chaos factor. But now nah, I love this little one. It's sit and stores on my shelf, nice and neat. Did, it, correct me if I'm wrong, did, didn't did you do a review on the Kraken expansion too? What, for Abyss? For, yeah. Yeah, I've done, yeah, the Beyond the Base game series. So I've done one for Kraken and Leviathan. They were the first two yeah. I did in that series. I remember that. I, I, I never picked up that expansion, but I, I definitely want to uh, I, I, after I saw that review. So I'm like, yeah, you did the you did the crack and the be on the base games. Yeah, that was yeah, a good one. I say they're both good expansions to pick. But I mean, as long as you get Leviathan first, you're on the way. You've got to replace that monster track from the base game. It's the one weakness. Leviathan solves that problem. But then, yeah, get Kraken later. So, <laughs> yeah, I, you're, you're right. I, I always found that true of, of Abyss as well, is that that monster part was a little weird. 
that. Yeah. Need all sorts. So you're two. 11,765. <laughs> Are you sure this is a gem? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it is it is definitely a gem in my abstract pile, um, okay. which is which funny enough is probably like the I have a, quite a few of them on this list, but the abstracts I think get less love because of them being abstract sometimes like you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. These so this days one is called like Gotham Euros. Got them just like that. Um, I think the box cover is probably in this case why it's a hidden one. <laughs> um, funny enough. Part of my story is I read I read the box cover and that's why I picked it up. The art, if, you could, if I can show you this guy, look, he's like so stressed. He says, if I can place one more card, I've got her. And like, oh no, she, she escaped my trap. I must not estimate, underestimate her again. It's like so over the top, right? <laughs> that doesn't, that, I would not believe this is an abstract game if I saw that cover. <laughs> here's, here's the deal in case they don't show you the two boards. Okay, good. There's one, there's one side of the board. Right. That particular board is like beginner side. Um, you you start on your own color square. You place down a wall. It's just a tiny little tile. You place down a wall to block off yourself from your opponents. You're trying to block everybody else in, like just like that. Right. You place a wall next to your piece, then you move your piece one square. Eventually, you and your opponents will run out of places to run, and you yeah. will have blocked somebody in. So. Pretty simple, right? It graduates really quick when you introduce, there's so many different ways to play. You can introduce cards and cards limit where you can, there they are, they limit where you can place walls. So this is kind of like now you're elevated to level two of playing this game. Place a wall on any blue square, you may move your pawn one square. So now you can't just place it by you, you have to place it where your card says. You get a hand of three to pick from, you know, it's one of those games where you draw one, and pick say, one in your hand. There's gotta be some mitigation, yeah. Okay. Then you can move from there to advanced play. That was who the art was done after, by the way, his, his style of art. And then your advanced play. Hey, that, that looks boring. Well, <laughs> this is just a okay. play board. <laughs> so the deal, with, the deal with advanced play is you are given no boundary. Like, the cards, how do I want so to explain you this? You, you don't have the cards then? You don't have the cards. You don't have the guideline of knowing your opponent's going to put a piece next to his piece by the same color of his square. Like it's it's free for all open. Like all the training wheels are off now. Right. And I and I know it looks very, very simple. Like it's very deceiving. It looks like a child's game, uh, but it is absolutely not. It is easy to play level one and level two with the cards. Level three on the blank side of the board is very difficult to win. Um, more, more, more people are sort of worried about the uh, the look of it or something. I mean, if you don't like how it looks there, then flip it over and just have a plain board, I guess. But then I want the yeah. color. Yep. But this one, uh, again, this has been again in our in our gaming store, quite popular. But it's popular when people come in to play it. They loved it, but again, hidden because you don't see it. Like it didn't get a lot of like see that weight one point three three. I. I agree with that on two of the ways to play. Well, but on no the one's third. heard of it. I mean, 11,000. I mean, this one, you know, when did it come out? 2012? To yeah. 11,000. I mean, this either got no buzz or there was something that somebody put out. Oh, Dice Tower actually reviewed this one. I'm going to watch that review after I'm done with the timestamps. <laughs> I've got to I've got to see what Tom Vassell said about this one because for this to be 11,000, I can't imagine he was... Well, the, this is 10 years ago, so... Yeah, well, you've seen early... his you've seen his series, right? Ten years, five years, one year, or whatever. Yeah, I wonder if he had it on there at one point. But oh, <laughs> but ten years ago, this is old school Dice Tower. But I got I got to look that up now. But <laughs> oh, nobody would have seen this one coming. I can tell you that. Interesting. I, I, hey, I try out. I took my job seriously. You said hidden. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll trust me. Yeah, I mean, if people give me guff for my games, maybe not being as hidden as much, they cannot give you guff for that because yours are definitely. <laughs> Probably the epitome of hidden gems. Whether yeah, they'll give me guff for the gems them. part. <laughs> That's what I mean. Whether they believe the games are good enough to be gems is another thing. But yours are definitely hidden. Like, wow, okay, I'd never heard of like ninety percent of your list. <laughs> yeah. That. I mean, I know Downfall. I do uh, the second one you mentioned. Uh, what was it? Uh, Unicornus Knights. And I think that was it. <laughs> the rest <laughs> of them are all new. <laughs> but. Fair enough. I mean, it's only learning about these ones. And where'd you come across this one anyway? I mean, have you just had it in the family for ages, or did you? Find uh, it nope. At a Again, store? at my game store. 
Yeah, but I didn't get into the game store. Oh, I I ordered it for the shelves for our merchant for our inventory. Uh, oh, so I, when it came out, you bought it. All right, fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I suppose yeah, 2012. I mean, it feels like ancient times, but yeah, it's right. like it's like it's a decade ago, which feels like ancient times in the board gaming world. But yeah, I mean, there was a lot of games coming out then. Yeah, Christoph. This one was 11, uh, Christoph, I do actually have something from Explore It series. I have uh, Sands of Shirax, the uh, third volume. Oh, but that I say, pick between this and that spaceship racing one as to which one he doesn't, which one David. Yeah, which one do you not want to look at more? <laughs> I think he'd rather look at this one, but only just out of it. This one wouldn't give me as much of a headache as the space racing <laughs> one would. All right, okay, moving on. To, let's see, that's number two. Right, onto ones, number ones. Here How we go. much more hidden can you get? <laughs> number oh, one. I right. I can get way more hidden. We'll see. Uh, right, again, this one, a bit like the last one, how hidden it is. Like I said, yours are definitely much more hidden than mine. So if I'm doing the gems part, you're doing the hidden part. So we combine the list together. <laughs> we'll have a complete hole. <laughs> so that's the way I see it. Because I reckon I tried to look further down the rankings. And I just realized I had not played a lot of those games that would be so well hidden. Probably for reasons that I would have looked at them and gone, no. <laughs> and that I just can't play every single game. I mean, you ran a store for ages, so you would have seen tons of games going through then. So that's probably an advantage on your part. I didn't start gaming until about what? Well, proper board gaming until about seven years ago. So yeah, yeah there was only so much and you can only try out so many games at Essen. But uh, all right, this number one, this is going back to Queen Games. So when you were talking about Skyland again, I said that, oh yeah, there's another Queen game on my list and this one never heard about i think it got a release at essen but no one talked about it uh, except for my mate uh, my mate russell who decided to keep banging on about this game until i played it and i was always hesitant because i thought it's queen games they're okay i'll humber and the mega nap but it's like am i that desperate to play and it's like it's a deck builder okay cool i'll go with it fine i'll play it i'll buy it let's just hurry up and try it runestones is one of my favorite deck builders I've got in my collection though. This one is a solid game that a lot of people, some people would have heard of, I think, but rank 1672, it's not well talked about and it probably isn't getting a lot of buzz, probably because it's a queen game or perhaps people, you know, don't, I mean, Rudiger Dawn, he's done some half decent designs, hasn't he? So, but this, Besides looking gorgeous, I mean, that was one thing that sort of attracted me in the first place. That's not the best photo, but the cards and everything like that. It's a very pretty looking game. But I love deck builders when they're pure deck builders. And this one is a pure one, so there's no side mechanic or anything like this. But what you do is you're basically just buying these little artifact pieces for various costs of gems. Trade the artifacts in. The more unique colors you do, the more points you get. Very simple. Turn mm -hmm. sequence is pretty straightforward. But all you do on your turn is either buy more cards. The top of the card is how many magic points you've got to spend. And you spend as many of the same color. And that's how much you've got. So I could spend three or two, depending which. Um, or you trade in artifacts that like you buy in the artifacts. Or you play the cards. But you play two at a time. And you resolve the ability on the left. It's double-sided. So left-handed and right-handed people can play it, which is quite cool. But... What happens is after you resolve the abilities of collect gems or points and that, the value at the top, the lower number goes into your discard pile. The higher number gets trashed out of your deck. And if it's a starter card, it's out of the game. If it's one of these cards, it goes into a communal discard pile. So in deck builders where you normally have to manually trash your cards, this one's already doing it for you. And so your deck is nice and sort of trim, nice and small, but you can still build up these combos of a particular color or point gathering that kind of thing some of them might like trade a blue for two points you know nice simple abilities but the turn sequence is just nice and simple and how it works but that decision of deciding i like this card but i like this card but if i play them both together i've got to get rid of this one that's no good what am i going to replace it with but the whole rune stones aspect is this part here when you trade in the artifacts as i said more unique artifacts gets you more points but every time you do it regardless, you get one of these rune stones, which gives you a power for the rest of the game. And they're all pretty decent powers. But then you've got to decide, well, do I take my time with the artifacts, trade in a ton and get a bunch of points, but then only get like one or two powers in the game? Or do you spam 
trading in artifacts as quick as possible. Not get many points, but then you get to pick up lots of these juicy powers which might propel you forward for the rest of the game. So you've got a nice bit of variety there. And I don't know, this one just really clicked with me. I wanted a symbol. This is like gateway level uh, yeah. deck builder. Not quite Star Realms level gateway deck builder, but certainly <laughs> ticket to ride level gateway deck builder. Because you don't have a huge deck. The abilities are dirt simple. You know, you can read two bits on the side of the card. It's well, like for queen games, this is like extremely beautiful. Um, you know, I, I think at Essen, they didn't give a full length game, which, you know, doesn't always help. But you've got little gem pieces. You've got the artifact things. And iconography is not confusing. I mean, you literally just trade in three, two, three or four of whatever color of the artifact is in order to get it. And these chop and change. So somebody might nick it before you do. And suddenly it's like, ah. So straightforward rules. Can teach it nice and easy. But it gives me a pure deck builder game. And I've even pimped mine up slightly to have a, uh, what they call them, like the raptor coverings over those player boards. Okay. So that I can slot the rune stones in. And it's got little cubby holds and that. Because I was say, I, I put off playing this game for a while. But it turned up at one convention local to me. And my mate kept saying, Luke, you got to try this one. I'm glad I've, he finally convinced me. Funny funny story about runestones. So yeah, I have heard of it. Uh, my wife and I were at Origins a couple of years ago, and we demoed that and Copenhagen. Uh, yeah. Same time, and Copenhagen won us over more than this did per their demo. Um, I've not played I don't, Copenhagen. I, I've tried that one. You know what I mean? So it's, it's funny. I'm looking over at my Copenhagen now because that's... Uh, that's I, I totally remember them demoing this with me, but it just didn't grab us like like Copenhagen did. But now listening to you having be more deck builder experience, it's one of her favorite types of games. Uh, my wife's and hmm. definitely have to give this another look. It's is this other one. I mean, not many people have heard it. They might have just glossed on Pag. They thought, oh, another deck builder from Queen. But it's there's un unless you want to play Dominion, which is still a cool game. I've got it on the shift on that, but. After Star Realms, there's a bit of a gap to what I would consider to be a simple deck builder. Yeah. And people will say, well, what about Clank or Tyrants and stuff like that? It's like, they're not that simple. You know, you've still, you've got the deck buildy part, but it's bolted on to this mass other mechanic as well. I'm sure. talking about a simple deck build to teach you how to deck build. You've got Star Realms, Paperback, I guess. You know, Paperback's a good one, but most people mm -hmm. maybe not into word games. But this is kind of that in between Star Realms, and I'd say, I don't know, it, it. I'd say this one's easier to pick up than Dominion. Hmm. Dominion, you've got to look at those ten cards and try and figure out how those cards are going to go together. And with expansions, Dominion can quickly get more complicated, you know. And you've got the meta yeah. stuff in it. This one though, it's just all these card abilities are just dirt simple. It's, I mean, it's basically like take gems or you know discard gems or get points. So anybody can get it from the iconography. But the powers, you know, can change things up. It's really nice one. And Nerd Shells has turned up. <laughs> <laughs> the actual Nerd Shells. So both Judy and Mike are here. And don't worry. You haven't got to worry about being here late because uh, we were late starting. You have to go back to the start of the video to find that one out. <laughs> <laughs> Some, well, on some time zone, we were on time. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're one. All right. You said I couldn't dig any deeper. Well, this one's not there. <laughs> so go ahead and type in Elvish Checkers. Not Elvis. Elvish. I literally Which... just typed in Elvis. <laughs> Elvis. Elvis Checkers. I wonder if yeah. I accidentally put Jeff's number one as Rune Stones a minute ago. I'm not sure. I'll That's all right. Check, but... I, get two, I get two number ones today. Rune Stones and Elvis Checkers. Uh, Rune Stones will make up for my Elvis Checkers. So funny thing about this, I think it's Dave Wanya. Was the... Let me see my notes here. Dave Wanya. Yeah, Wanya. Published three games by uh, Three Sages Games. Now you'll see this is not listed on like as far as a rating. It's so low, it's not there. Um, uh huh. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, it's got the average rating from the game, but yeah, it doesn't have a ranking. But looks of it. So, not a whole lot of photos. If you look at the one in the middle there, it's a tube. Uh, yep. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> Bad. So Bad back tubes. when they published these games, that was their. They had two gimmicks. That's the second one. The first one was they all came rolled up in a tube. The first the, that was the first gimmick. The second one was they all came in a pouch, like so, so you could carry the games in a bag. <laughs> this particular game, once again, abstract, right? Uh, they were 
they were made, I don't want to say cheap because this canvas bag is like however old that that year says it is. And it is held up for years. 2005, um, yeah. I mean, 2005. Yeah, okay. Came out. So this canvas bag is held up just fine. And the canvas bag is the board, right? So if I were to hold up this bag, there, see, that's the board you're seeing on the, I know. On the screen. As I say, back before uh, Pax Premier and all that tried to make this a thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the board. Um, you are moving your pieces from one edge of the, in this, the theme is very loose, right? Because it's abstract, but you are two elves and elvish tribes in a forest. And you only get to move one elf at a time. And any time two take up a space, that space is then blocked. So you're trying right. to block your opponent's pathway. They're trying to uh, infiltrate your side and you're trying to infiltrate their side. First one to get all of their pieces on the other side of the board wins. But right. the, the caveat is you see the stone that's not translucent on kind of the left side. Mm -hmm. Each side has one of those that's a wild piece and it can move instead of one of your elves. And every time it overlaps any piece, they get sent back to their respective homes, which is that side on the far right or the far left. And those pieces have to start all over again. That big, they call it the, the stone man or something. I don't remember his name, but he just continues to move forward. Once it gets all the way forward, it kind of warps back to the beginning and keeps moving. So you have two choices. You can either move one of your elves, which are the translucent green pieces, or you can move your stone man to try to send your opponent's pieces back home to start over. All Once right. you pick a path, you can only keep going where those two little diagonals show you can go. Only move one space at a time. Fair dues. I mean, so, another abstract game, I'd try it. I'd probably yeah, lose it every single time. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's funny. I, this is another one of those where I got my kids to play with me a lot. I got a lot of people. Uh, they they really like it. Does it's one of those games? It doesn't seem like a lot, but when you get into it, you're like, oh man, I I see what I could have done better or different now that I get it. It's one of those second play type of oh, it clicks. And the other beauty is it's like twelve minutes. Like, hey, thanks, David Jackson. I like the sound yes, of it too. That. Well, um, well, this one doesn't insult his uh, retinas, so he's uh, happy. Oh, with got this. it. Okay. <laughs> Gotcha. So that's that's Elvis Checkers. They they also made a couple other games. Uh, Gnome, uh, what was it? Gnome Stone, Dwarven Stones. They tried to make this theme around fantasy uh, races, uh, Gnomes Crystals and Dwarven Stones. But this one really kind of took off as their as their flagship game. I don't know what Three Sages ended well, up putting out well, after this, but you say took off as their flagship game. It's not even ranked on Board Game Geek. So... Well, yeah, the others the others didn't take off at all. So imagine. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure if "took off" is the right phrasing, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, so that's uh... I can't. I don't know why this isn't listed actually. Although, 15 years ago he's reviewed this. Oh, I've, I'm gonna have to watch these two reviews. I gotta see what <laughs> he's thought of these ones. Some of his kids wouldn't have even been born when he reviewed this one. <laughs> yeah, his family would have been a lot smaller, but. <laughs> So anyhow, that's my uh, that's my going from highest to lowest on the list. That's a uh, that's a good you've abstract definitely one. Got, for you've, sure. you've definitely got more of the hidden ones, but some of those sounded interesting. I would try Elvis Checkers. I it damaged my retinas, but I would try the Space Race one, just as being a Space Race. I think the biggest one I wanted to try was your um, Oshi, Yoshi. I think oh. that was a, I think that was the popular one in your list of like, ooh, you know, people that are interested to try that one. Because even I'm like, hmm, if I see a copy of that, I want to try it. Yeah, it's a good one. Of that, as for my ones, it's kind of like it's like hidden question mark, but like, you know, a few of them like Spike, not many people have known of, and a couple of others, but yeah, some of the my other ones were probably not uh, Old West Impresario, not as common, Warp Gate, definitely not as common, but the other ones kind of oh, that, Hive Mind, it varies. <laughs> I'm I'm looking forward to trying that Abyss. What was it, Abyss Conspiracy? Conspiracy. Yeah, I'm yeah. really looking forward to trying that one. Um, Spike, I don't know. Like I said, I have that other, uh, or no, that the, the Western one. What was the Western one with the Old dice West drafting? Empresario. Ah, Old West, yeah, Old West Empresario, uh, Tasty Minstrel. Yeah, absolutely that one. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one as well. Yeah, that. Anyway. Oh, okay. That's cool. Because, because I don't know if they're doing a third in the series, but it's like most people might have recognized that one instead, which was the one ah. that came before it. But okay. uh, this one had a different dice drafter, but it was that same world setting. It's the same art. Okay, style. so they're not interconnected in any way, shape, or form, though. Not in terms of mechanics and that. No, I mean, literally like I don't have to have played the other one. 
they are connected solely by the blurb at the start of the book. So <laughs> you have survived the hazards on the Pioneer tra Oregon Trail. Now you're building your city. That is about okay. as strong a link as there is. Okay. <laughs> so, so Good to know. Like, no. Uh, what have we got? The, uh, my old hidden gems, Sunrise City and Praetor. Heard of both. Not played them, but yeah, not many there. Uh, as I say, this one's always a fun list to do because I don't know if I've done a hidden gems one before, but uh, certainly it was. It, this was a Patreon suggested one, I think. Is it? Was it? Did I give you this one as an option? You did. Yeah, because I asked my Patreons to say like, right, you know, you're up a tier lot. Here's a bunch of top. I need top ten list ideas. Give me them, and they gave me about like three Twitter thread pages worth or something worth of ideas <laughs> i just basically everybody i've said i've just basically spammed you know everybody to say right pick one and we'll go with it uh what's it that uh majesty of the realm was the only one that was a bit too well known really hmm. fair hmm. enough i didn't actually think it would be that well known i was more afraid of something like coffee roaster or uh um you know maybe like you know unit what was it called walking in burano and abyss conspiracy i thought they would be more well known but you know, as like I say, I don't think any of mine were ranked below a thousand. So whether um, Jeff's is more down the hidden gem route, mine's more underrated games. <laughs> well, I suppose yeah, I think I, I think mine were definitely more hidden, but yours more gems for sure. <laughs> you, work. you know, I think you you should try Skylands if you get a chance. The one by Queen. Actually, yeah, Skylands and Oshi were the two on your list where I'm sort of going, hmm, okay. <laughs> so I got to try yeah. those ones. Because uh, the way you mentioned the way you mentioned calling Carcassonne for that um, that other one from Mushroom Games. Oh yeah, yeah, small a small island, yeah. Small island. So the way you mentioned calling that, I was thinking, okay, I wonder if you'd like Skyland. So I bet you would. It's got some of those similarities on there. I mean, I'm trying to see. I'm looking at like my collection of stuff I've rated, and I'm trying to. I'm I'm going down to like my bottom. So. My lowest rating game I've ever played is 20,583, Man Bites Dog. And I think I gave that a three. So, yeah, that's probably not saying that. We didn't play test this at all. Pointless, the oh. board game, Smiley. Ah, Smiley Face could have been a good hidden gem, actually. But I don't think you can get it anymore. Uh, that was when Fantasy Flight was doing their weird selection of games. You had the emoji yep. faces for yep. cards. That was actually a neat little card game. Uh, we didn't play test this at all. It was such a great name for that game that but the thing is as i go through this lot i am seeing ratings of three five three six six five four five two three six five it's like nothing's got to a seven yet oh hang on uh jiguan the eastern mechanist uh this was a pretty complex emperor s4 game they put out okay. uh, a couple of years back nine nine seven two ranking and yeah that one it was a decent enough game but it was a bit too convoluted for many uh veer and piston ghost geometric art downfall Oh, I did give it a seven. So, oh, look at that. <laughs> so but uh, on two different downfalls there, same listing, which is kind of weird. High risk Cornish smuggler. No, I didn't like that. Orc Olympics, bleh. Narabi, King Frog. What on earth was that one? Nine Worlds. No. Uh, that was have have you played Lucidity? No. Another. You have not. No, I haven't played that one. I should have should have thought of that one. Lucidity is a dice drafting game as well, and it's. Very interesting. It's horror, horror based dice drafting. And like you can you basically it's like a nightmare realm and you can choose whether you want to survive the nightmare or be the nightmare. One. Of, yeah. And one of each other way you can win the game. But that's a very interesting one, too. I bet you that would be ranked 3000 or higher. <laughs> yeah, there's a few there. I mean, we're getting more into 7000s when I start getting to like crazy carts, seven out of 10 museum rush, three out of 10, didn't like that one out of 10 fruity de mer. That Vinny Panty Pasty game, the area control pasta game. Yes. Hate that game. Friends of mine at Dice are big fans. They love it. They showed it to me. And I just thought it was one of the most broken, annoying <laughs> area control games I'd ever played. And yet it's, it seems to have its fans. It's down yeah. there, like rank seven and a half thousand, and it can stay down there for like. <laughs> it's funny how some games can be like that, right? Um, what's mm. that one by Steve Jackson that people either love or hate? Revolution. Yeah. I'm indifferent. It's okay. But like, there are some people in both camps, like diehard camps. Like, I will never play it, or it's my favorite game ever. Like, there's some some game some games just resonate with people like that. The thing is, Revolution has two different rule sets, and I must admit, I don't like playing it with the mean variant because when you do the bidding, if you lose the bid, you lose all your stuff in one of the variants. I hate that way. 
Yeah. Because it's like, well, it's not like I had a huge amount of control over the fact if I won the bid or not, but yet I lose all the stuff I earned. It's like, no. It's like, if I lost, I don't get the cube on the board. That's already punishment enough. Don't then just rob me of all my stuff. It's like, come on. <laughs> so, Michaela says top 10 most hated games. Could you imagine like how long that would take to shrink that list to 10? <laughs> uh, the problem is people already know what most of my top 10 hated ones are because I don't think it was that long ago I did a list on that basis. And yeah, you're just talking things like, you know, from Fruity de Mare, Food Chain Magnate. Uh, the, the people are really expecting me to put stuff like Great Western Trail and Concordia on there. And granted, I do hate them, you know, so, but would they make my top 10 hated? I don't know. I mean, you're talking, as much as I don't like those two games, you're putting them up against stuff like Monopoly Deal, the card game. You know, it's like the <laughs> stuff that's legitimately just bad as opposed to, you know, because I can't say that, you know, I can't say Concordia is objectively bad. It's You're putting them up against stuff like this. Yeah, <laughs> it's got a half decent design, and it's uh, you know, it's it's obviously it functions and it looks nice and stuff. But Concordia just drives me up the wall. But yeah. I can't say it's like overly bad. I just personally hate it. So there's a bit of a different story with it. Uh, but well, again, I mean, it some, wasn't some, it wasn't bad games. It was games that you hate. So there's that's those are two different lists, I would think. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not the sort of person to say a game is objectively bad anyway. It's like, whatever, so one man's bad game is another man's treasure, so it works on there. <laughs> somebody had mentioned, was it, uh, was it somebody, yeah, you guys could do a series on like your favorite to least favorite games based on the game company. Wasn't well, that just the same as doing a top 10 list for publisher, I guess? I mean, I've already right. done yeah, one I think that's what year. the idea is there, top 10 queen games or your top 10 really... power, power grid expansions. <laughs> Top 10 power grid maps or whatever. I got paid again. <laughs> Ding. I mean, that there's a, there's at least 10 maps written there. I don't know. You could probably do that. But I mean, I've already done one earlier this year, top 10 portal games. And I know when I do a lot of solo top 10s, I need to start looking at other publishers as well. But, you know, there's, although not every publisher has released 10 games I enjoy. So there's only so much you can do on that. Some publishers haven't even released 10 games. So yeah, <laughs> through that, it works. especially in these days, like I'm seeing more and more new publishers all the time. Yeah. New people coming out of the world. I mean, even I'm thinking Brian Lockett, Red Raven, have they done 10 games? They've done some like smashes and they've done a fair few, but I wonder if they've done 10. That's a now. good question. I, I'd be surprised if they did actually. I, th I don't know. There's a few I can think of like city of iron. And, uh, there was one sailing around little islands. I can't remember what that was called. Uh, that was different. I've got Ancient World there. Emperor of the Void. There's a new one called Rome I haven't tried. Haven. I've yet to even get that to the table yet. So uh, there was Eight Minute Empire that technically I think Red Raven did. That was horrible. But that was like one of their first things they ever did. So yeah, I mean, hard to say. Maybe they have done 10. Uh, Nerd Shelves but, is having some fun with you. Oh, they. Well, of course they will. <laughs> but top 10 games you want to break up with. What, oh, no. Your top 10 has... Stefan Feld games, too. <laughs> Love Stefan Feld, yeah. I I, Amerigo was the one Stefan Feld I actually didn't mind, but that was when I was first getting into gaming, and then I played other games, <laughs> and I don't have Amerigo anymore, but I would still probably play that one. But I yeah. like Din Rolls. I like Din Rolls. Top 10 best setup to gameplay ratio. I love that. I love that. I pick a game a lot on how quick or simple or well-designed the setup is sometimes. So I guess like how what would the gameplay ratio be? Because I mean like well, you, meaning, could teach it, you, is it, you could set up an abstract game in two seconds, but how much But is the do you... but is the abstract game also good that got set up in two seconds? That's the ratio, right? Like it was oh, really good and it only took two Oshi? seconds. Or yeah, Oshi, right? <laughs> but it's, you know, would that work with that? I guess like what I suppose is it a case of right, we need the smallest setup time for the biggest amount of gameplay involvement, I guess. Yeah, maybe. that's possible. It's just an interesting work. thought, right? Because for me, like Marvel Legendary, forget it. I love that game. I'll never set it up. I, I know what you mean. I've got it in that crate up there. All my Legendary games, right? Alien, <laughs> Predator, and Marvel Legendary. I've stopped buying expansions for Marvel Legendary now because probably some of them I haven't even tried yet. But yep. I've got to get that box off the shelf, put it on the table, then sort out all the decks. And I'm just like, no, I can't sell this game. But I like the game, but I don't want to set this thing up ever. That's why I like Sentinels in the Multiverse a lot better, because at least I just get my deck and there I go. But... There's a channel. Can you believe there's a channel just for Marvel Legendary? Bagel Top Games. Bagel, like you eat the breakfast bagel? Right. Bagel and Top Games. Marvel Legendary. It. That's it. He I says... Mean, 
the game is He cool. says he's got a, a, a bona fide way he's going to teach me to streamline the setup. I hope to learn oh. it someday. And if that's you... the case, I told him I'll play it. But that game, so that's a perfect example of a game I won't play because of the setup. Uh, an interesting idea for a list. I'm going to have to think about that. Yeah, games that put you off for the... I mean, somebody did ask if I did a top 10 list for... Um, like one was it games you would change one thing or like games you would like except for this one thing setup would probably feature into that i wonder how common the setup puts me off a game but uh there's a few of that that'd be interesting um yeah. scott reckons he's counted 16 red raven games so uh, more than i thought <laughs> wow so he's, have i played 10 of them i suppose is the next question on there uh not even I... not even merlin no i didn't like that one at all i mean it had the blandness of a failed game <laughs> but yet then had the luck of the dice rolling. It's like, okay, so, you know, you're just making it even even worse. Somebody mentioned Aquasphere earlier. That one was just, oh, look, another failed. It's like, uh, uh, was, I mean, Amerigo, I genuinely actually liked. Just probably wouldn't play it now. I didn't mind Notre Dame. Notre Dame oh, was yeah. okay. I, I thought the card selection in that was fine. Uh, I don't like Castles of Burgundy, though. I don't like Bruges. I've not played Bonfire, but I don't exactly expect that one to win me over. Hated Bora Bora. Uh, <laughs> trying to think what other felds there are, really. Obviously, that not played Tuscany, uh, or Burgundy, or whatever it was called. Castles of Tuscany. Uh, Trajan. Oh, God, yeah. I hate that one. I say, there, it just reminded me. Yeah, Trajan. No. <laughs> how, many, how many mini games out of my sock drawer can I shove into this box is basically the, the name of that game. No, I, I can't think of uh, one of those. But now there's a a few little top tens in there, and I'm certainly going to do more uh, solo ones of that. But anyway, two and a quarter hours. We need to shut this down, sadly. All right. <laughs> but we'll have to we'll have to get on and do some discussion topic at some point. Maybe not like a top ten list, but just find something to chat about. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A, pub a publisher or something like that, and we'll make certain we get the time zones agreed <laughs> in advance. <laughs> All good. I didn't, I I didn't know you had two out there. I think I think it's a fault on both sides. Like I say, I gave you a GMT time not realizing oh yeah we've got the daylight savings scene and then obviously it's confusing elsewhere so i think we just i think i just need to like get a really comprehensive list of every time zone when i do stuff so that there's no like somebody just has to look at the list and go oh that's me right we're good say <laughs> <laughs> so, time zone absolutely fail. we'll see uh jonathan says we need four squares like the uh, dice tower one i've not tried a live stream with more than two people i think it would be ins it'd be interesting to try a discussion top a discussion video like not a top list because we'd be all day but right. a discussion topic where we could get three or four of us in i mean yeah could you imagine like us two nerd shelves and well that's four people already i guess yeah like all four of us trying to discuss something and agree on it yeah i don't know we'll have to try that at some point i don't know <laughs> give me send me an email all right anyway thanks for tuning in for this one guys uh boardroom gamer as i say definitely check out the channel i've now got to load it up again because i had to get rid of it from earlier because i didn't know you were going to turn up until 10 minutes into the stream it's like thank god you did i don't think this would have been anywhere near as entertaining if it was a uh, just me <laughs> doing it but by all means 259 come on guys let's get that up let's get that subscriber count up there's a ton of solo play like content whether you see them on twitch or not two player tuesdays so solo play mondays in fact you've got the walking and barano one there there so it is you want to you want to see it in action? Go see a solo playthrough and watch the mystic hand flying all over the place. <laughs> you and your green screens. Uh, yep. And a few others there. But yep, plenty of contact. Check out his channel and give him a sub. Give him a like. So that's it from us. We'll see you on the next one. Format. Luke, of these thanks so much. Yep. Honestly, good to have you on, mate. And as I say, for those, you'll find out more in a video tomorrow. Some format changes I think are going to happen with the collaborations and future just to try and keep the lengths down in that but uh you're the last you're the last one on the uh ones that should go to like two and a half hour long streams or something i'm hoping to restrict them a little bit just from stuff there but you'll find out more on that tomorrow but yeah this is good we'll get you back on for another topic at some point mate so it's been good fun Take all care. right so thanks for watching guys it's been a lot of you in the chat some really good uh comments there and um, we'll see you on the next broken people video so take care and remember it's only a game no matter how obscure and hidden it is. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone.